Hello and welcome to the Cuyamaga Institute and our Q&A conversation for our exploration series. I'm Paul Robert, the Executive Director and President of the Institute, and along with my wife, Laura Lee, the Director of Research, Education and Outreach, we want to thank you for joining us today. For those of you who are less familiar with the Cuyamaga Institute, let me briefly tell you about our mission and who we are. The Cuyamaga Institute is an independent, nonprofit anthropological research organization committed to expanding consciousness through the ancient practice of ecstatic trance postures. It was the insightful work of our founder, anthropologist Dr. Felicis Goodman, who found the clues and revived this practice. She had searched for the oldest evidence available, which she discovered in the world's collection of prehistoric and indigenous art, and decoded these selected artifacts as ritual instructions. So we set aside these Sundays for a chance to go deeper through conversation in not only our own work, but we also invite scholars of parallel research in related fields to help us broaden the scope of our work and exploration. On these Sundays, we've had sessions recently talking about neuroscience. Uh, we've talked about states of consciousness, the anthropology, art history, archeology, span archaeoastronomy, shamanism, wisdom traditions, and much more. And of course, the many aspects of our own work from the last 50 years. And part of the mission is looking to the connecting point of our experiences to the web of life. On our planet, animals have been here much longer than us, and it's no wonder that the world of wildlife has fascinated humans from the earliest of times. And as we look back at our human ancestry, and the artwork of indigenous cultures around the world. There's something about our relationship to animals that we've documented from the beginning in the art starting on cave walls. The earliest known cave paintings depicted of our relationship with wildlife are about 40,000 years ago. And in Africa, the Bushman rock paintings at about 8,000 BC clearly depict our relationship to antelope and other animals. So as we move forward today, Let's take a safari to the cradle of civilization, <laughs> Africa. Laura, I'm gonna turn it over to you to do the introductions. So, well, I wanted to start with a personal story before we introduce our guests as to why I'm so fascinated by the wildlife. I know we all are. Every time that you have those moments where you bump into some wildlife when you're out hiking or wherever, and they look you directly in the eyes and they acknowledge you. Mm. It's like an imprint. It's just this wonderful moment. And I remember each and every encounter so vividly. And I want to tell you about one before we introduce our guest, who's an expert in African wildlife as safari guide. But I want to take you back to Seattle's Woodland Park Zoo when my brother, Alex, had an, uh, an appointment with the keeper of the lion house. And he was able to, he was invited to go behind the scenes into the lion house where the zookeepers cared for the lions and all their cages from all the different big cats they had would have one door into this long, narrow room where they had a rolling cage. So Alex invited Paul and I to join him. This is an extraordinary invitation. And so we end up in this cement, long, narrow room with a rolling cage down the middle and all the lions and leopards and cats around uh, around it, surrounding it. And the lion keeper said, we said, what's the rolling cage for? And she said, yeah, that's for us. Because these cats watch you intently, whether you know it or not. They're observing everything we do. And if the keeper in before us happens to have not quite got the lock on correctly after they've cared for the animals, then that animal is quite capable of opening the lock and you're in there alone and yeah, you're, you're toast. They would much prefer to be in the wild. They see you either as the enemy or as prey and they will go for you. So she said the smart keepers tug this rolling cage along with them as they administer to each cage down the row. And I thought, okay, that's interesting. And then she said, I'll leave you to it. You, yeah, just don't, just don't put your finger, don't, touch the bars of the cages to all the animals. So of course I touch the bars mm -hmm. and I'm fascinated by the lions and I see the lions lounging. There was like half a dozen of them lounging at the far end where their enclosure opens to the public and they're just sitting there. And I, I'm like, 
okay, I am seeing you lions much closer than I would be if I were in the tourist section, which I was, and looking across the big divide, and you are right there, and I put my fingers over the bars because I'm standing close to the bars, and this lion at the far end is suddenly charging me. The moment I put my fingers around the bars, this lion is up on his feet, and in two leaps, he's just, all I see is a lion head coming at me, and I'm like, (gasps) and I step back, and I release my fingers, and he slams against the bars, and lightly drops to his feet and glares at me. And then he saunters back over to where he was sitting and harumps down and is lounging again. And I'm like stunned, thrilled, adrenaline. I'm like, oh my God, is this what it would be like to be a hunter-gatherer back in the day and you see a lion charging you? Where do we get that experience? And the lion was signaling to me he knew that i knew that i wasn't that i knew that he knew he wasn't in going to go for my throat he wasn't going to reach me he knew that there were bars i knew that there were bars but still he performed this amazing feat like that on his feet slamming against the bars as if to say hey girly i know the rules and you invaded my turf. That's your turf. This is my turf. Don't come into our territory. Or he was saying, I appreciate your admiration because I was truly admiring these, these creatures. But um, let me show you off and you can see what I can really do. And just, just the prowess, the magnificence, the, the oh my God. Um, so that was my moment with the lions. And I have just been intrigued ever since. And so, and so when a friend of mine said, you know, I am reading the Londa Losey blog every morning. It's how I start my day. And I just like seeing the wildlife and what's going on there. I said, what, is, what, what blog? And I have been reading this blog for about a year. And I am so intrigued with the work that the safari rangers are doing there. They know each animal intimately, at least the big, the big predators. They track them. They um, bring the tourists there in open jeeps while the lions are lounging at their feet. They've got this communication with all of the wildlife to say, yeah, we're nothing here. Never mind. We're just going to be here observing. Click, click, click at the cameras. These are people passionate about the wildlife, conservation, zoology. They know their stuff. And it seems to me that where we can be a tourist and go and have these encounters with the wildlife for maybe a week, several days in a row. These are the guys and gals that are out there day after day and year after year. And I think that relationship changes you. I think that relationship is something I want to hear about. And so let me introduce to you our guest, James Terrell, Safari Ranger with the Londolazi Game Reserve in Skukuza, South Africa. I know I didn't. Hello, everyone. <laughs> he's got the degree in uh, zoology, but he's also had this adventurous life, snowboarding and climbing Colorado's mountains, surfing Australia and Indonesian waters, wandering across Africa, his home country, um, before settling down at the game reserve Londolozi, which is Zulu for protector of all living things. They're in the heart of the Sabisan game reserve within the greater Kruger National Park. So if a saf- African safari is on your bucket list, this is a good preview. If you've been there, this is a good uh, visit again. And uh, we are talking with this t- 2018 Safari Guide of the Year. Hello, James, and welcome. Hello. Thanks very much for having me, Laura. Pleasure to be here. Nice yeah. to get to that to everyone. <laughs> so uh, how did you end up uh, on safari? Uh, taking the tourists out, and and uh, it's a good use for your zoology degree, I have to say. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it's it's a it's a bit of a roundabout story, but I think so many young South Africans grow up wanting to be game rangers. I think that that's the bush bug bites very early on for a lot of a lot of South Africans because there's kind of a split between those who go to the bush on their holidays and those who go to the beach. And <laughs> I I often, yeah. yeah, 
And I, mean, I was from Cape Town, so I kind of lived at the beach. So our holidays would be, when I was little, we'd go on these sort of epic two, three week missions with our parents and, and, and friends up into Namibia, Botswana, um, these long camping expeditions where we'd be roughing it and lions would be prowling around the tents at night. And I just remember that thrill was just so ingrained from such an early age. Unfortunately, we didn't get to do it enough because it was only every t- once a year, once every two years. Um, but I always knew that somehow my life would be permanently in the bush. Uh, I didn't, I didn't, I'm not one for planning too far ahead, which is probably uh, not a good trait. Um, but I remember the being very aware of London Losey, which is where I am now, from an early age. John Varty, who is the co-owner and co-founder of London Losey Game Reserve, um, he was a, a world-renowned cinematographer and one of the earliest cameramen to properly document wild leopards. And there was a film released in the mid early eighties called The Silent Hunter. And it was the first real look into the life of a wild leopard, which is a whole story in itself. It was, she was, there was a, a female leopard that lived here um, who, was, who affectionately became known as the mother leopard. And she was essentially the first leopard in the world that was relaxed enough to let game vehicles view her on a daily basis. It wasn't always easy, they'd, they'd have to track her. So a lot of the local guys would be brought in, their indigenous tracking knowledge would allow John and his colleagues to follow this or to find this leopard. When they did, they'd be able to film her, spend time with her. And she started relaxing magnificently around the vehicles and realized that, okay, this, this Land Rover that I'm seeing isn't a threat, it's not a food source. Um, and she allowed them this amazing window into her lives. And from that, developed this relationship that we still enjoy today. Her cubs would grow up being relaxed around the vehicles because they inherited the same trust that she did. Um, and John produced this amazing documentary called The Silent Hunter, which was about this female in particular, but about leopards really in general. And that came out in the 80s. And I remember seeing that movie when I was about five or six years old. And I looked at John's existence in the wild and in particular his relationship with the tracker he worked with called Elmer and Flongo. And I just thought these two guys were the coolest people on earth. And I wanted to be, I wanted to be them. <laughs> and then I, 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 it wasn't a kind of long-term plan to get to London Losey, but I remember when I, I finished university and I thought, what am I going to do now? I don't want to go down a corporate road. I want to be in the bush. Uh, that's kind of an existence I want to pursue. And someone just mentioned, I can't remember who it was, but a friend of mine just, because oh, I think I was going to go to, uh, apply to a different reserve. And someone mentioned, oh, what about Londo Losey? And suddenly all this, all these memories came flooding back of the silent hunter and John and Elmon. And that it kind of just this, this pathway just illuminated in front of me. <laughs> and so, and, and it, as luck would have, would have it, I actually knew a guy who was working here at the time. So I got hold of him and, and, arranged an interview and a, and a whole series of chats with the manager and the head ranger and was, uh, through some fortunate series of events I, you know, I ended up um coming to uh, start as a ranger at the end of 2010 and i've been here ever since and it's been a life i only only dreamed of so yeah it's, it's <laughs> daily magic yeah. you mentioned the first leopard that became comfortable enough to allow the the jeeps to come up and the cameras and the the humans to sit there and observe so it's really kind of a learned thing with the with the top predators. It's kind of a learned from cub to mother to cub to mother to cub, and they've all just been adapted at that reserve because it is rather unusual that you can be in an open jeep, isn't it? Yeah, very much so. So there is a definite process of habituation in their early months, and it can take a lot longer than that. During which we are very sensitive in our viewing approach to these young predators. Um, and it's it's a lot easier to habituate them when they are young, when they learn quite quickly when they're little, the threat levels to which they're exposed from all different aspects of their environment. Um, so when they're little, we, we adopt this approach of only viewing them when the mother is with them, because they get a lot of confidence from her being there. They read her behavior and if she's if she's scared, they know they should be scared. And as a result, you know they, they form that association with whatever the threat might be. Um, so when they're young, we only view them when the mother's there and we'll generally only go one vehicle at a time or maybe one vehicle per day or per game drive so that just slowly but surely their confidence grows 
and hopefully by the time they're six months old, they just kind of ignore these, these Land Rovers. We just look like an extension of their environment because they know their mother's happy with us so they can be happy with us. And we do find that it's, it is dependent on the individual. You get some leopards, some lions that are a little bit slower. Yeah, they're a little bit more skittish and it takes a little bit longer, the whole process, um, to get them used to the vehicles. And some, the first time they see a car, they are more than happy and they, they don't, they don't mind it. They don't mind us being there. So it does vary quite a lot between individuals. And that's a cool thing as well, because you start appreciating the different cats. I don't want to call them personalities, but demeanors. And you know that, okay, this male, he's a little bit more aggressive. This female, she's quite relaxed, so we can view her properly. And you make your decisions in, uh, for the, the viewing purposes with your guests and how you're operating in that particular afternoon or morning based on what you understand about the individual's demeanors and it is an age thing like i was saying earlier the younger ones tend to learn about a lot faster we'll find that older leopards that happen to move into the area from a part of the reserve where they may not have seen vehicles just just to give you some geographical geographical context sorry I'm messing my words up some geographical context we are open to the kruger national park which is off to our east which is an enormous reserve it's our flagship National Park, South Africa, um, with very few um, roads running through it. It's, it's a monstrous reserve, which is run by the government, so it operates slightly differently to us. We are a private reserve, um, but you get areas there that are so large that you might have a leopard that, that don't have roads in them. You might have a leopard growing up that has never seen a vehicle in its life, and a male that grows up to independence he'll then get pushed out by the dominant male, probably his father, and he has to then go wander off until he can find an area that he can establish himself and then start a territory, start mating with females. So every now and again, we get these independent nomadic males wandering in from the wilderness into Londolozi, and they don't know about vehicles. They haven't been exposed to them, and they're you know, two, three, four years old. So it's generally a much longer process to habituate them to the vehicles. I mean, for instance, in our, in our southeastern sector, there's a male living there at the moment who I've seen twice in two and a half years. Uh, He's been around that long and dominant, but I've only seen him twice because every time we find a kill hoisted in a tree, he'll slink into the bushes and he won't let us see him. You'll just get a fleeting glimpse as he you know, sneaks off into the long grass. Um, and we still, after even being sensitive, only one vehicle at a time, slowly trying to gain us trust, it's still, it's still difficult. But it's, that's what makes it exciting. It's still wild. It's not like it's a zoo. It's just, it's a wild animal and you have to gain its trust. And that in itself, that process is, is a very cool thing to embark upon as a, as a team of guides. So it's, yeah, it's, it's and awesome. It's neat that you know all the individuals and you know you have names for the, the pride. You know, you watch the mothers raise the cubs. Are they uh, milking the, nursing the cubs? Are they, you follow the whole history. And mm. so we get to through your blog. Um, you mentioned the Kruger National Park. I know you're part of it. We had interviewed Kobe Kruger a long time ago. She'd written a book about raising th uh, three daughters and a lion cub when her husband was a ranger at, at Kruger, um, no relation, she said, but she talks about how they, he brought home a cub whose mother had died. So here they raised it in the household and that the family dog was the dominant to the little cub, even when the cub grew up to be a big lion before they released him, that he followed, he, hey, you're the mom and I'm just gonna follow your cues and that the lion liked to uh, ride on the top of the Jeep, the cab of the Jeep, when the, they would go out. And just the, when they had visitors, they, she said they had to feed him a lot of meat so he would go and sleep it off in a corner and the visitors wouldn't even know he was there. That was the way to um, knock him out, go feed him a lot. Mm -hmm. And he'd just yeah. sit there. It was a, it's a really a wonderful story. The other thing she said that was so interesting was when her daughters who grew up on the bush, they later had to move back into... Uh, Johannesburg and town and go to school and they were asked to draw a picture of what frightened them the most. All the other kids drew the bush. They drew the city. That's what frightened them. <laughs> so, yeah. It's, it's about right. yeah. interesting about how you are, uh, how you adapt. I think the ancient Egyptians had pet lions as well. 
So, mm -hmm. um, but so interesting. The pictures are stunning um, in Love Your Blog of the lions lounging around. Here's the Jeep. You see the people in the Jeep, the lions are lounging around. You could reach out and pet them um, yeah. and they pay you no mind. That That is pretty. And James is going to provide us with a nice slideshow of some yeah. of this imagery. He's a, he's a photographer, so that's going to be fun. And I, I wanted to follow up on a question, just kind of jumping backwards. When you said the term indigenous tracking knowledge, yeah, that, there, about there's something that. about, there's some, what is that? So, yeah, so I mean, a, a lot of the local people in this area, so where we are, it's the, the Shangan tribe, which are a smaller subsection of the Shitonga people which inhabits this part of South Africa and then Eastern to Mozambique. Um, historically, as you mentioned at the start of the talk, you know, the, a lot of African indigenous tribes were hunter gatherers and the hunting would involve a lot of tracking. If you wounded an animal, um, I know Paul, you mentioned the sand people, they are master trackers. You know, they'd shoot a, at an antelope with a bow and arrow the poison that they were using the arrow would slowly bring the animal to its knees and but in the interim it would run off and disappear into the thicket and it was their tracking knowledge that enabled them to then find it and then once it had died they'd be able to find the body harvest the meat and that's how they would support themselves and a lot of that knowledge was the same thing all over africa i know the, the san are revered for their tracking knowledge but it's not just them and multiple tribes had similar have a similar history of existence in the wilderness and is particularly prominent in this area and what you've seen and, and this is a whole side story we can go into later but you know the last 20 30 years have seen a shift in existence and a lot of young men in particular are moving to a more um uh, urban existence rather than a rural one and the indigenous skills of tracking that traditionally were being passed down from father to son uh are slowly being lost, sadly, because young boys aren't growing up to pursue that same lifestyle. And what a lot of the trackers at Longolozi, the senior trackers, would do to learn their skills is they would be tending cattle out in the wild and they'd have to find the cows at the end of the day if they had wandered off, if they wanted an impala or an antelope for the pot, they'd track it down. Um, and less and less is that knowledge being passed on, sadly. So there's a whole other conversation to be had about a tracking academy that was established by two Londolozi um, alumni, our ex-head ranger and a, and a previous uh, head tracker here. Some of the greatest, I mean, the, the tracker who assisted in starting is one of the greatest trackers in Africa. It's currently still very much active. He travels all over the world and um, passing on this knowledge. And, and it, it was, I think that the guys felt it was very important to try and maintain this knowledge. Otherwise it, it gets lost. It's a skill that has essentially been around since the birth of humanity. I mean, it's what it's literally the oldest art form in the world. Um, and the history of London Losey is very closely aligned to tracking the early days when they were trying to find this mother leopard in particular um, that I mentioned earlier, the, the Varty brothers, who are the two co-owners, they, they started London Losey, John who's the cinematographer and Dave, his, his younger brother, they recognized the value in leopard viewing in particular they had this unique opportunity to show guests wild leopards that no one else was able to do um, but what they needed to do to, in order to find them was to track them so what they would do is recruit some of the local tracking talent who at, the, at that time when there wasn't really a photographic safari industry um, wow. they were a lot of the local trackers were classified as poachers because they would be subsistence hunters who would go out and take an impala for the pot, but where the impala were existing at the time was a wildlife reserve. So they were classified by the authorities as poachers. And in fact, they were trackers who had inherited these skills from their fathers. And Londolozi recognized the value in these skills of being able to then to find the animals that they needed to show guests. So they brought along a lot of the, the local, the, the, the hotshot talent from the, the local communities to come and track leopards, track lions, track rhino, and through those tracking efforts, they were then able to take uh, guests and to show them the wildlife, show them, um, get photographs and the, sort of the, the, the Londolozi reputation for wildlife viewing grew from that. And it's something that still occurs to this day that the tracking is very much what we rely on to find wildlife, to find big cats, to find 
rhinos and it's very much part of the experience and our our game drives on a daily basis are attempting very much to showcase not only the wildlife but the skills of the local people that have been passed down for years and we try and instill a reverence for those skills in all the guests that come to come to the reserve and also make them economically viable so that those skills can be employed in this uh, wonderful way that's true yeah. so yeah, yeah what, is the, what is the tracking skill i mean is it watching it's the, the sure. bent leaves the footprints the direction the, all the signage of where and what just passed by and how long have yeah it, it's it's countless hours spent on foot examining track after track following animal after animal i mean there's there's only so much you can do to explain what to look for but it's it, it's basically a very simple form of pattern recognition yeah. and you know when you first start out tracking you can recognize a line paw print if someone points it out to you you know okay that is what it looks like in its purest form there's a toe there's a toe there's the back pad i'm looking at it now okay the more you follow the tracks of a lion and the more difficult the terrain is of you that you're following it over because sometimes it's a sandy substrate sometimes it's gravel sometimes it's rock yeah. the more your brain gets wired to recognize the subtler signs so when you start out it's just one track then one track then one track that you're looking for when you get better you're not just looking at the track in front of you, you're looking a little bit further down the road and you're seeing a track at 10 meters instead of at one meter. And then you start seeing two toes rather than the entire track. And then when you start getting really good, you just see a slight discoloration in the earth. And on a, on a rock, you'll see a little bit of sand that, where the line stood from the sand and then onto the rock. And I remember a, a tracking effort I was I, I was not involved in it at all I was just following the master trackers I was just I just happened to be there I was adding no no value whatsoever but I was with one of our senior trackers a man called Judas who's been here for 50 years tracking wow. and I remember he showed me we we're following a leopard she had killed a, a small antelope and was and had dragged it across the road that's how they first got onto the tracks they saw the scrape mark going over the road and a drag mark is a fairly easy thing to follow but after about 30 meters after she'd walked into the bush the drag mark disappeared. And when that happens, you usually look for signs of fur and blood because you presume that hyenas had come in and stolen the kill from the leopard. That's what happens quite regularly. If the leopard hasn't managed to hoist it into the, the kill into the a tree in time. But Judas said, no, no, that, there's none of that sign here. And that's a fairly simple thing to do, uh, to, under, to see that there was none of, no signs of a struggle. And what he said is, no, no, this leopard has now picked up the carcass in its mouth and it's now walking so now it becomes very difficult because you're just following the footsteps and a leopard can tread very very lightly and when you're moving through an area where there's literally no sand it's just leaf litter and rocks and grass cover you can't see any individual footprints you might get 100 meters between the two of them and I remember at one point Judah said to me you know look she walked here and I said well, how did you know that and he pointed to a little leaf and he said this leaf was there it was here and now it's there. And I said, well, no, it's actually quite <laughs> frustrating being with someone that good at, their, at what they do. And I asked him to explain to me, and he said, no, no, there's a, you know, if you look at all the other leaves, they are unimpacted by anything, they're just bleached by the sun. This leaf has sand on top of it, which means that it was facing the other way. And he pointed to a tiny section in the leaf litter and he said, no, no, you see the slightly darker patch. That's where there was no sun shining before. So this leaf was there and now it's been moved, which means the leopard has trodden on it and, and shifted it. And it, I mean, it, it absolutely blows your mind, but that is what he has been able to, the skill level he's been able to achieve after just 40 years of daily going out and following a leopard's trail and seeing it over and over and over again. So these guys are kind of at the, the extreme level of, of the tracking skill and it's phenomenal. It's unbelievable, it blows our mind every day what these guys are capable of seeing i'm fascinated by this because we read so much in our environment we have so many messages bombarding us at all times this is what humans do right we read our environment but if you take all of modern culture away and you go back to our hunter gatherer days um a few millennia ago then we were employing those same skill sets that same pattern recognition that same detail the same visual acuity 
um, and we were employing it on our environment. And so we are so amazed by dogs with their infinite sense of smell and, uh, and hearing. But we also had a similar skill set in the wild where we could read our environment. And this was just a normal skill. And when we go and looked at the the cave art in Europe, I haven't gone to Africa yet, I want to see that cave art, and there was animals, but we've, we have to see it all in Europe. And you look at the different depictions of animals on the cave walls, precise detail of the various stages of life. Is it uh, in estrus? Is it pregnant? Is it foaling? Is it male? Is it female? What season? Does it have its fur coat of winter? Does it not? Is it summer? Is it all these details are beautifully depicted. And it took the guide to point that out. See this, see this, see how beautifully these people dial it back 20, 30,000 years, where did 17,000 years depicting the, the animals because they knew them so intimately. And probably that was part of their mythology and their storytelling and that everyone recognized the signs and, and the characters of them. So what you're describing to me is a skill set that I um, know that we once all shared um, living, yep. living er, early, early on. So I, I thank you for that description. Um, I also know that I watched a video of three tribesmen tracking a lion's pride who'd made a kill and then boldly just walking up tightly together, the three of them, walking up, the lions ran off and they go and they take the lion's kill, cut off a big haunch of an antelope and walk away with it. Describe that one to me. <laughs> that is like so yeah. cool. Like that makes sense, but wow. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a funny one to comprehend. And I know you were talking earlier about um, the kids that moved to the city who depicted the city as their fear and uh, people who lived in the city depicting the bush as their fear. Um, and I think that's a, that's a kind of misconception if you haven't been exposed to it, our, our place in the wild. If you haven't spent time out here, you don't appreciate the, the threat that wild animals view us as. Yes, we as humans, we're fairly frail and you know there are a lot of dangerous animals that we can't compete with certainly on a physical level. But whether it's genetic memory or whatever it might be, animals see us as a danger. And what you're talking about so. is a lot. Yeah, and lions will see people, and, and I've had many experiences with this when lions make a decision in fight or flight, and they choose flight most of the time. And the, the kind of story you're talking about, I've seen the same video, I think it was in, in Kenya, I think, or Tanzania. Um, that used to occur here as well. So in the early days of Londolozi, when there were no guests, sometimes the lodge was kind of abandoned for a couple of weeks at a time. The guys were just starting out. Um, and there were no visitors and it was just a couple of, excuse me, a couple of the local trackers living on site. The early, the early trackers and staff members, um, and this is the 60s and 70s, we're going back a long way. The guys would do the same thing. They'd find a leopard kill hoisted in a tree and would go hack off a, a limb from an impala. They'd find lions on a buffalo kill and would run in with tin pans, chase the lions off. And I think the, the uh, yeah, and quickly, you know, hack off a hunk of meat. Yeah. I think the... Lions, they, they sometimes take a while to gather there to assess the situation and the instinctive reaction when a big noise comes in, people come running in, is to flee and assess the danger. Because a lot of animals, because they are living day to day in what's essentially a fragile state, if they get injured, they then can't hunt, they can't keep up with the pride, that can be a death sentence to them. The safest option is usually to just move off, reconvene, and then decide, you know, assess the threat level. And a lot of the, the early um, employees in the reserve in the 60s would take advantage of this fact and do exactly the same thing. Run in, big noise, movement. It would give the lions a fright. And before the lions even knew what was happening, before they could run back in, quickly hack off a buffalo leg, and then the guys would yeah, scuffle yeah. away. And then maybe the lions would run back in and take control of the kill again. Um, but by then it was too late and the, and the guys had got away with it. So it's, it's certainly a risky business, but, <laughs> but it's a beautiful it's explanation. It needs, it needs and it yeah. also explains why house cats are so skittish. <laughs> 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 They've kept that trait. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh my gosh. So tell me about, um, you, you break down in a Jeep because sometimes you get stuck in the mud or whatever. And now there's lions over there 
and what do you do while you're waiting for a rescue or getting pulled out and you have to step outside the vehicle because part of the rules for your tourists, I mean, you want your tourists to be, you're safe, your, your, your visitors to be safe. Don't step out of the Jeep. Don't make a loud noise. Can you look the lions in the eye? Um, do they you hear you clicking your cameras and look up at you? At you? I see yeah. that. Yeah. I think it's, it's a very good question. I got asked at least the same question recently about whether lions see you as uh, individual human when you're in the vehicle or whether they just see the whole vehicle as one entity and, 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 and ignore you as a result. Mm. And I, I think they, re- yeah. Yeah, yeah. 100%. And I, th- I very much think they do recognize individual people within the vehicle because I know I've had lions walk past so many times and they stop and they look you in the eye. So they know that you are a, an organism and, and probably human, but in that, in, yeah. in that package, you are harmless to them. So that association that they have of the vehicles being no threat, not a food source, that association is so strong because it's the only one they've ever known with a vehicle. They are, you know, non in, in non-confrontational as a result. So, and I have been stuck a number of times when their line is close by. Generally, if you do have to alight from the vehicle to put on a tow rope or something like that, you stick very close to it. So you, you don't want to go wandering off looking for a log to put under the tire. You stay very close. So essentially not to break the outline of the car. Um, and hopefully you can do what you need to do. And, and one of the things we tell our guests, in fact, when we first go out on safari is guys, whatever happens, don't stand up. Because as soon as you stand up, you suddenly break that vehicle outline and you are now a human in their space. And how it works really is there are distinct zones within which animals feel less and less comfortable as you come closer. We've got the comfort zone is when you're far enough away that they'll see you and ignore you and they'll think, okay, well, that person or whatever that might be is something that's not a threat to me. And if you're in that comfort zone, you can, I mean, you can be going for a jog and doing handstands and they're, they're fine because you're far enough away that Mm-hmm. They can ignore you safely. Elephants are comfortable like that, I think, too. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it very much depends on the day and on the individual. Then you move into the the alert zone, and then you're close enough that whatever animal it might be is starting to pay attention, starting to think, "Hang on, this person or this thing is coming close enough that I might need to make a decision soon." And they're sussing you out, and they're having a good look. Then you enter the warning zone, and that's when you've come close enough that they feel that they need to let you know that they're there and they are potentially dangerous. And that's a growl or maybe a charge from a lion. And and again, it very much varies depending on the situation. If a lioness has cubs, if there's a kill or if lions are mating, the zones are generally gonna be a lot, lot further out. And then the final zone is the critical zone. And that's when the animal has to decide fight or flight. And it's either gonna attack or it's gonna run away. Um, and by being in a vehicle very close to them and then suddenly standing up, suddenly now you're a person that has bypassed all those zones that they oh. need for them to kind of make decisions and to process. Suddenly you've gone from comfort zone to warning or critical zone and you're right there and they have to then uh, make a decision and they run or they charge. And so that's why we implore people just stay seated because as long as you stay seated, they're fine because the zone for a vehicle, the comfort zone might be 10 meters, but for a person on foot, it might be 100. And by standing up, you, you break that outline and you're suddenly in that zone and then, then they react. So, beautiful. Yeah, as long as, yeah, as, long as you're careful when you're stuck, it's, you're fine. There's like a rule set that they find, mm-hmm. I, I think. There's, there's just rule sets. And so the moment I put my fingers around the bar and I was technically in the exactly. lion's space, he reacted. That, that's it. And they watch you so closely. Mm-hmm. I. They're just watching every tiny movement. I had a zookeeper friend describe a baboon that kept escaping from the the zoo. And then they couldn't figure out how was he getting out the lot? Well, he had, somebody had set down a, what do you call that? I don't know. Little wire thing that you clip, paper clip. Paper clip. Paper clip. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Paper clip. And he had watched the zookeepers unlock the lock, come in, lock, so he knew how the lock worked. Somebody had set down a paper clip. He just surreptitiously put it in his mouth. He shaped it to go in his mouth. Uh So the zookeepers didn't see it because he didn't have pockets. 
<laughs> and he didn't have a hiding space. And at night he would go and take the paper clip, unlock the lock with it, bend it so it became a, a key, unlock, mm. wander around happily, just I'm just gonna mm. have a wander, walk about, go back yeah. in. So they are watching you intimately, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 And they're working at us, yeah. <laughs> yeah, very much so. We've yeah. had, I mean, just, just on that story, we had, um, so we are, we try to be as non-impact as, as try and be as sustainable as possible at Londolozi. And we, so we recycle all our rubbish and we uh, partition it into plastic and you know, we try and minimize our single use. At, you know, there's still some that gets in, but we have these cages um, with the different rubbish bins or trash cans um, in them that are allocated to whatever needs to go into them. And the cages are mainly there to keep baboons out during the day because they'll go in and, and rummage around and, and steal things and make a mess. And occasionally hyenas will come in at night. And in order to prevent animals getting in, there's a swing door and a very firm spring-loaded bolt that uh, it's a sort of slam lock system and you have to really exert yourself to, to open it up. And a couple of years ago, a, we, uh, we found that after dark, a lot of trash was being left was being left around and rubbish was strewn everywhere in the morning and baboons aren't active at night they sleep in the trees for safety and we couldn't work out what was happening because baboons have the manual dexterity and the strength to be able to open these cages if they really wanted to but this was happening at night and we couldn't work it out and so one of the guys put a, a trail cam up an infrared trail cam to see what was happening and a hyena had worked out this is a, an animal that doesn't have opposable thumbs or anything. And this hyena had worked out that it could climb up, grip the bolt in its mouth and pull it. And they've got incredible neck strength and unlock the cages that way. And it would be able to gain access to the rubbish bins. So now what we've had to do is weld on a kind of mesh bar over the bolt that a hyena can't put its mouth onto. You have to sort of stick your hand into this wire tube and, and pull it out. But, uh, Hyenas as well. It's not just baboons or primates. It's it's everything that has the intelligence to work things out. They they adapt and they they learn how they can benefit from whatever it might be that you're doing. So this must watch really octopus uh, do puzzles. You know, in their yes, things. yeah, my oh octopus teach that. I don't know if you've seen that. Yeah. So this must really have impacted you personally in, in terms of seeing the intelligence behind all of this because we have this perception of humans being the dominant species with all this intelligence the and then smarts. all of a sudden you have a direct <laughs> relationship to nature that most of us never get to have. Yeah, I think, and that's the, it's in a way it's kind of like the, the, the habituation of young cubs for us. It's, the, the reverse happens here that some people working and living in the bush move down that kind of appreciation path slower, some move faster because uh, not everyone stays for as long as I've been in the in the reserve. I've been here 10 years, some only stay for two, three. Um, and I, I know for me, I, I think I, I look back with a little bit of regret that it took me so long to get into this mindset, this understanding of, well, not a complete understanding, but a better understanding of our place in the greater scheme of things and the fragility of everything exactly and the, the the connections that we can form and i don't necessarily mean on a personal level with an individual animal but a, a kind of connection with nature um and that that reverence which i think is is very much lacking in many parts of the world particularly in in, in urbanized cultures and just going back to the tracking and how much a part of our historical dna it, it was and still actually is and it's not necessarily being brought out that's why we have a we place a very heavy emphasis on getting guests involved in traditional practices here so traditional dancing we'll, when we're out in the field we'll go tracking with guests specifically and get them to follow the tracks uh, and it fun. kind of really wake, yeah and it yeah. reawakens this this kind of primeval feeling and people are so revitalized by it um it's pretty emotional i mean it doesn't even have to be a particularly difficult track you don't even have to find the animal but just walking in the footsteps of something wild that walked here yesterday it's it's pretty real and that there's an exposure element in which you feel more and more alive and i think especially it's, it's especially valid when you're on foot i mean in the vehicle is one thing you can get close to the wildlife um, but when you're on foot and you feel vulnerable and out of your elements which is essentially what was historically that's our element. element yeah uh, yeah that's that's when it kind of reawakens this 
there's a thrill and I think it's not even there's a sadness in that what's thrilling for us now used to be the day to day. Yeah. yeah. So, and I think we, as, as, as rangers and as guides, especially here, we're fortunate enough to be the guys who get to go out into the bush regularly and go and track animals. Even on our days off, we go out and we just track things because it's, it's fun. And that, that <laughs> fun is that, that feeling, it's feeling alive. And it's because we're doing this, this ancient, they're taking part in these ancient um, sort of rites that used to be and essential for survival. Now it's it's you know it's it's ridiculous that it gets to be an enjoyable pastime. Let's call it, but it used to be what determined whether we lived or died, whether the tribe sank or, or swam, and um, that kind of re-immersion into into nature is is it's it's very cool to kind of process it yourself and look at your own journey down that path, whether it be tracking, whether it be working out what the weather is going to do based on a bird's behavior. Um, it's cool. So really looking at your own sinking into it is, it's pretty special, but you, there, there has to be a kind of a level of self-awareness there, um, which can take longer for some people to get. Some people get it right away. And I know I was slow in getting it, but I'd, I'd like to think I'm going along that path now of just being a little bit more aware of what, of the greater picture rather than just looking at an animal and appreciate it being there. Yeah, you know, there's one thing to have it as an intellectual stance and it's another to just feel it and get into the groove of it. And I believe our ancestors were not just for survival, but they had a just on a mystical relationship of appreciation with these animals and how magnificent they are. That is what is conveyed in the artwork that they left behind of it, I think. But my sister um, and her um, ex-husband used to boat a lot. They would go out on a huge boat up into the um, inland sea, uh, uh, north of Seattle, into that inland sea, and they would spend months at a time. And her descriptions of it, and for example, here's what she describes. And Kim, if you're listening, you can pipe on, just jump on. But she describes, okay, we go out in the little Boston whaler, and her husband was a musician. He brings his guitar, and they've just got blankets and pillows, and they're just going to hang in a little cove. And the cove has a cliff. And he's got his guitar. He starts singing, and the, the echo off the cliff. And pretty soon, they notice a bear that just is sitting like this, listening. They notice whales, orca, popping up. They notice the birds circling around, the eagles circling around. Yeah. They notice um, the wildlife just coming like to enjoy the concert. And she just said, after so many months, you, you're not talking to other people. Maybe you see some other boaters. Maybe you go into the marina and get supplies. But she said, nature takes over your brain and you settle into this expansive um, Zen relationship with all these surroundings yeah. around you. It just happens. She wasn't, they weren't trying, it just happened. So I am intrigued that perhaps that's what you and your fellow guides are enjoying because you're there. And during the pandemic, when you didn't have guests, you were out there still photographing and blogging and giving us your reports. So um, I would assume that's (laughs) that's available to us. And speaking of that, let's let's look at some some slides and look at some photographs. Let's look at some slides, Before we turn on your slides, I wanted this one final comment I thought was an interesting one that was brought up here uh, by Elizabeth. Does habituating the game to the vehicles make the game more vulnerable to poachers? Oh, that's a good question. It's a very good question, and the answer is no. So, I mean, look, it would obviously depend on where you are, but in our reserve, where we are, we're fortunate enough to have a very effective anti-poaching unit, um, where they keep the wildlife uh, very, very safe. Um, most 90% to 99% of the poaching out there in Africa is done on foot. Um, and because a vehicle would draw too much attention, you know, you'd hear it coming and it would be easy to track and follow and it wouldn't be very efficient as a butcher. Um, and animals, even in our area where they see us all the time, they're still, like I said earlier, they still see humans as a threat when we're walking, when we're on foot. That's why we talked about the comfort zones. So there has no, there's been no real loss of fear of the human form on foot in the bush. And that's essentially what would determine a, a vulnerability. And as long as people, as long as they still see us as a threat, then 
exactly the same, whether it's a poacher, whether it's someone with a camera, they'd still feel as threatened and move off. And that's, you know, that's what you need for them to be, um, not be impacted by the, the photographic safaris and the viewing that we have. And happily, the camera has replaced the, the rifle in most cases. Yeah, yeah. There, yeah most, that, that's your yeah. weapon of choice as a camera. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you have some slides for us. Um, lots of stories. I and I think you listed questions and you, you uh, yeah. so kindly um, have it. Yeah. Yeah, but, Laura. So, I mean, I look, I've got quite a few and there are, if there are too many, we can stop early. If they're, if they're not enough, I'm sure I can oh, no, find no. a couple more. Let's gamble. But they can, it's it's kind of in an order of, we talk, we'll talk about just some of the wildlife viewing, stop a couple of stories, and then there's a bit of a historical element that I've put together on um, the early days of Londolos that we can zoom through there. And, and we'll, let's just kind of take it from there and see, um, yeah, just take it. See, yeah. see where we end up. So let me just share my screen. Um, yes. Anyway, so, so this is kind of, I mean, just contextually, this is, this is what we were doing for a lot of last year during the pandemic. We were essentially trying to take Londolozi and the wildlife viewing experience and broadcast it to the world. The whole industry shifted to an online media space um, through which they were trying to get a, a representation of their lodge and their their um, the product, let's call it, um, and keep in the forefront of people's minds so that when the pandemic lifted and, and travel started up again, you know, people would want to visit their lodge. And, and, and we did exactly the same thing. So we were out producing these little wildlife documentaries and mini stories. And our whole um, approach was to try and produce these little mini packages that were very digestible. This is where we are. This is the animal we're with. Interpret a bit of the behavior and then close it up. And it's just a sort of four or five minute package. Um, instead of doing a whole one hour live broadcast which i know a lot of a lot of reserves did do we, we decided not to because uh, there's a um it's very much dependent on what the animal's doing then and if it just so happens the lions are sleeping it's hard to make it really exciting when you're not actually there so we decided let's just make let's just film it and then edit and package in a small little clip and then it's we can wait till there's action and then you know keep people engaged like that because i know on, on social media these days it's what you're dealing with very short attention spans. It's a swipe down, swipe up, swipe, <laughs> swipe, keep swiping culture. Um, so we wanted to keep it as short as possible and, you know, take sightings like this and represent oh, them in a kind of fun. an impactful way. And I mean, that's a, this is still one of my favorite photos. It's a, you know, a mother leopard and her cubs and a, and a rhino. Um, and none of them are facing towards the camera, but I, I, in a way I kind of like that. It shows that they're not really impacted by us being there and, it's two sort of iconic African species um, in or juxtaposed with the rhino ignoring the leopard, all of them ignoring us. And there's a kind of, I don't know, I kind of a, the disinterest they're showing in, in the vehicle and, and the cameras, I, I kind of enjoy it. So uh, this is actually, it's from a couple few years ago. And um, for me, it's, it's still one of my, my favorite photos. Um, and that's the kind of enjoying, the kind of viewing we can enjoy here. It's, it's, Look, not every day we're going to see something like this, but these animals are there. And I mean, leopards, we live in what, the densest leopard population yet recorded in Africa. Wow. And this is what we're talking about when it comes to habituation. So this is a young cub who both of these leopards are still roaming on Londolozi. Uh -huh. um, this cub <laughs> has, has since grown up and has had cubs of her own. And she's just given birth to her second litter, which we've yet to see. We know where she's keeping them in a little rocky outcrop. Um, but we haven't seen them yet. And her mother is um, still is still roaming the reserve. She's our oldest territorial female at the moment. And she's uh, also, we think, pregnant. Um, and look, not every viewing is like this. This is very unusual. This is just a case of a young cub being curious. And this is, we'll see them go through periods where they come and investigate the vehicle. And so it, it goes from a level of uncertainty when they're very young then they grow up because of our sensitive approach to kind of accept us then they have this curious phase where they go and have a look and this cub was actually looking at its reflection it was a rainy day as you can see by the bonnet oh, and so okay. the reflection was in the side of the vehicle in the door and um, and then they move on a couple of months later and realize okay well this vehicle is not doing anything it's not a food source it's not a threat so i can just ignore it completely so this is really an extreme example of of the kind of thing we can see but, um, but it can happen, and you can see the mother is totally unfazed as well. And they ended up, I think, going past the bonnet and uh, yeah, walking mm -hmm. off in, into the afternoon. So, pretty, pretty magical experience. Um, 
then the line viewing as well. I mean, we're not, we're certainly not all about leopards. Um, you were talking earlier, Laura, about how we get to follow the individual animal stories. And this coalition was a group of four males that dominated Londolozi and the Greater Reserve for about eight years, which is almost unheard of. So generally a male lion's tenure is around two years over a pride or over a territory. These males stuck around for eight. Wow. And at one stage they were, and, and just to give a bit of um, sort of ecology insights here, the, the, I think a, a common misconception is that a lion pride has a big male or a couple of big males and, and they're all one unit. And that's in actual fact, they're two very separate dynamics at play. One is the prides that are moving around and that's the females and the cubs. And they are territorial in their own right. And then the males that are a separate entity and the coalitions, which are the groups of males or individuals, they are also moving around, working things out between them. So that the coalition territory and the pride territory, although they can overlap completely, sometimes there's a very big sort of discrepancy in the areas that they control. And in this case, these four males at one stage were dominant over five different prides at the same time. So the males would move between the prides mating with the different females and siring cubs with uh, with all of them and their legacy is still around to this day they have offspring that they sired that are still producing cubs females young males and um, so it's the whole line dynamics is based on genetics who can survive to to pass in their genes and we have followed the offspring of these males for years so like you're saying we're, we're able to follow the individuals and um and see what they get up to how they differ in temperament and, and please stop me at any stage if you have any questions about well i'm sure that your research over the years is valuable to um research in general to science um, yeah we especially in the leopard front we are part of a so we, all the reserves well almost all the reserves i can't speak for everyone but keep very um specific records of what was seen on what day and in great detail so for instance we would say on this day we saw these males they were with this pride they were at this location on the reserve Maybe they had a kill, maybe not. Um, was there any mating? Was there, if there was a kill, what was it? Um, and when it comes to the leopards in particular, we submit all our sightings data to an NGO called Panthera, which is a big cat conservation group based out of New York. And they have archived all this data dating back from the 1970s when records first started getting kept of high profile sightings. So they have this amazing record, the most comprehensive record literally on earth about leopards that comes from Londolozi and the surrounding reserves. I mean, just to contextualize it, the, the definitive textbook on leopard behavior, which a lot of guides studied and still do study, and it's, it's a great textbook, but the research done to analyze leopard behavior for that book was a study conducted on, I think, six individuals that had been collared in the Greater Kruger Park that the researcher never really saw. He would just follow them and analyze kills that they, that they had made and based on their movements that, uh, through the radio tracking would establish how big their territories were. Six leopards. Now the data set that the guys from Panthera have uh, based on the historical records of the Sabi Sand Reserve, which is the one Long Lozi forms part of, has over a thousand leopards. Wow. It listed it. And that's all meticulously recorded with what kill, who was mating with who, and what day, how many cubs survived, all of that stuff. It's fascinating. Plus, plus photos. Uh, now, this is also interesting. What are the different hairstyles of the uh, one's got a comb yeah. over, one's got kind of a. Yeah. <laughs> a like this, was actually, this is interesting. And cave lions yeah. did not have manes, and cave lions stood a full foot taller than today's lions. Yeah, I mean, to be fair to these guys, it was raining on this day. And I think this, okay. these two guys in the middle, I think they'd come from, from cover. They'd been sneaking under a bush, whereas this male was out in the open. You can actually see, if you look very carefully, you can see some water droplets there. Um, <laughs> but it's cool. I mean, you can see here how they, they're all facially quite distinct. And these males would have all come from the same pride and have shared a similar lineage. But yet, individually, they're all very different. Um, and in fact, with these males, we could even see which when they when the females they had mated with had cubs we could generally tell which cub had been sired by which male based on facial structure coloration of the fur yeah so it's it's pretty cool getting to know the different traits of the individuals oh wow i enjoyed your blog on how uh, to see how they age and the characteristics that come in with aging 
So you can tell. Yeah, that was, that was written by a guy called Nick Sims. And it's cool. It's a nice way to kind of get an introduction as to how you, you see a photo of a lion and you can assess, okay, well, is he in his prime? Is he not? Is he still on the up? Is he aged? Yeah, it's, it's a very cool way to, um, it's a good step towards un- uh, interpreting animal behavior. Because if you know what stage an animal is in its life, you can make far better uh, calls on why it's doing exact predictions, why it's doing what it is doing. And, you know, lions, elephants, leopards, similar thing. And this is, a, again, just, you know, the kind of viewing we can enjoy. In fact, this female is the same as the one from two photos previously with a little cub up on the, on the running board of the Land Rover, slightly different litter. But you can see how these cubs are very relaxed. They're not looking at the Land Rover at all. And this is also testament to the, to the sensitive approach that was adopted when they were young. And it helps if we find the den, because the females will keep the cubs a little rocky outcrop. They'll, find, they'll keep them in a den for you know, a couple of weeks and then move dens. And, and the earlier we can find the den, the sooner we can start the habituation process and the sooner the cubs get relaxed around the vehicle, which is of benefit to them and it's of benefit to, to our guests. And that's where the tracking comes in. So if we're linking back to the skills of the, the Shangan men that are working at Londolozi, tracking and finding the animals, they're able to follow the tracks of this female through the bush, through very difficult terrain, essentially, lead, eventually leading them to, to a spot where she's, uh, she's stashing the cubs and then the whole habituation process can begin. And so I, I, these I are all just like- if it was almost like a sixth sense that the trackers had because they're taking in so much data that it kind of just processes almost subconsciously. Yeah. So did they ever describe it as being a sixth sense? Yeah, it's a funny one. And getting and knowing a lot of the trackers like I do, some guys operate very differently to others. Some guys have this remarkable intuition. And I, I, I think some of it's probably just based on years of experience. Mm-hmm. Um, but there is definitely this kind of intuitive, almost wizardry involved in some of them. There's, there's one tracker, tracker in particular called Freddy, who he used to be a butler. So he would be working in the camps and serving meals and drinks to the guests. And then he started going out to learn tracking from from the head tracker at the time. And this is about 15 years ago. And he picked up these skills very quickly without really having any tracking background before. So he didn't grow up tending cattle like a lot of men from his age would have. Um, But when he started getting on the road and actually actively being a tracker in the field, he started displaying this uncanny intuition, sixth sense, whatever you want to call it. He's kind of like a savant, just knowing this is what will happen and why. And I've been on tracks with him before where he'll just say, okay, based on what I see here in a kilometer down the road, we're going to find these lines on a buffalo and lo and behold, 20 minutes later, there they are. And he had nothing but footprints to go on but yet just his, I don't know if he picks something up in the air and he can smell some pheromones or what it is, but time and time again, he's just made these calls that are so unbelievably freaky in their correctness without any evidence that we can see. It just, it, he blows minds on a daily basis. So there certainly is some kind of sixth sense, but I don't know what it is and I don't know where it comes from, but it's there because I've seen it happen for sure. Um yeah, so, I mean, this is this is kind of, look, this is uh, just a sort of lifestyle shot of, of Londolozi. This is on a, you can see the Drakensberg Mountains in the background there. That's South Africa's longest mountain range. They run for a thousand kilometers down to the south. And we can see them way off to our west um, in, the, um, in the sunset when it goes down. Unfortunately, just behind this rock, it's blocking the view into the Blyder River Canyon, which is the third deepest canyon in the world. So the Grand Canyon's first in the, the Fisher River Canyon, which is in Namibia, just past South Africa, and then the Blyder River Canyon in the distance there, which you unfortunately can't see on this this photo. But I know in the, in the email you sent me, Laura, about how or why I do what I do and what kind of, I don't know, what keeps me going. It's, it's this, it's being out there in the bush, in the wilds, I don't think we were looking at anything particular this evening. This is Kevin and, and Pete, they're two rangers who work here. And it's just special times like this out in the wild with friends, essentially, you know, living this amazing lifestyle um, and feeling, you know, your, your life is dictated by the rhythms of the day. When animals are moving, that's when you're out. When it's hot and they're all sleeping, that's when you go and have a snooze. Um, it's very cool working on these circadian rhythms that the animals are, are following at the same time. And 
I just want to journey back briefly into the early days of Londolozi. I mean, this is now a very one of the first trips that were taken up to the lodge. It was all wagons. Um, Londolozi was essentially a bankrupt cattle farm in the 20s, and it was bought sight unseen by the early, the, the first owners, which are John and Dave Varty, the current owners, their grandfather. They were at a tennis tournament, had a couple of gin and tonics, and they heard about this land that was on for sale for, I think it was 238 pounds, which is oh nothing. It was quite a good investment. Yeah, I mean, it was like being offered an early stake in the, the Ford Motor Company for $1,000. You know, you'd, you'd probably want to take it. Um, and they would have to travel days on the train and then get off at a siding, load everything up on, on, on wagons and then, and then travel up to the Sand River where the camp is now. And, um, and slowly over the years, wildlife started relaxing around the vehicles. This is actually in the Kruger Park next door to us in the 1950s. And you can see lions that already started seeing vehicles. So they were, it had been so long since the hunting days, which are the early parts of the last century, that animals were starting to relax around around cars. You also and mentioned you they like the roads because the roads are clear for them and they don't have to like plow through tall grass. So they like the roads. Yeah, exactly. And that's what we see today. So tracking is, is definitely aided by the fact that the animals see the, the two tracks as bigger game paths. Naturally, they'd be on paths anyway that would be formed by elephant, rhino, buffalo, big animals moving through, especially near water. You tend to find these dirt little single tracks developing. Um, so there's a fair amount of prediction that can be used in tracking. If you can't see the next footprint of a leopard and the bush is quite thick, you can say with a fair amount of certainty that it's, it's probably moved along in this direction. Um, so it definitely helps the effort. This is now John and Dave Varty. This is John on the left and Dave on the right. And they're the current owners of Londolozi. This is back in the 70s when they first started the lodge. And they were visionaries, I mean, way ahead of their time in terms of realizing how conservation should be conducted, how care of the land should be incorporated with care of the people as well. They were very clear that the economy of wildlife was necessary in order for the reserve to be maintained, um, especially in a changing South Africa. You can't be an island of wealth in a sea of poverty because there's a lot of, there are a lot of impoverished areas surrounding wilderness areas in Africa. And it's very necessary to involve local communities in the well-being of wildlife, to see them, to see wildlife as a sustainable resource. Um, and it's the ethical so, thing. Sorry, could you say it, Laura? And it's the ethical thing to do. Yeah. hundred percent. Exactly. So, um, I mean, we are heavy, we have a heavy level of community involvement. 75% of our staff, 80% are from local communities and out of a staff of, uh, by 250, you're looking at 200 breadwinners that in turn, on average, in a local African community have around 10 dependents each. So London Lozi, as a standalone operation, is essentially supporting around 2,000 individuals from the local community. And we're just one reserve in a great reserve of multiple lodges. I think there are over 50 lodges in the, in the greater area, some quite a bit smaller, some a little bit bigger. Um, but the economy of wildlife essentially ensures that there is sustainability, there's employment, there, and there's longevity in careers and education, and um, and the wildlife is seen as a, as a resource to be managed. Yeah, uh, sorry. The world. So. Yeah, exactly, and it shouldn't just be limited to Africa. It's the kind of it's the kind of mindset that and, and practice that should be um, that should be exported. In fact, the early days of Londolozi, there was a well, actually in the in the nineties. John or Dave Varty started up a company called Conservation Corpor uh, Corporation Africa, which exported the model, the sustainable model of uh, community involvement in wildlife up through Africa to East Africa, Zambia. Uh, I think they open lodges in, in Kenya, Tanzania. And this was essentially showing how this model could be and was functional and worked and wildlife and people could, could benefit. And these are just a couple of the... For all of us. And North America used to have the lions and the camels and the rhinos and the elephants. I mean, that like it's, it's such a special spot that these have survived um, through the... Yeah. Yeah. The vigor. yeah absolutely. And, and it's, it's they're these shrinking wilderness areas. And I think part of the, the mission of the, the Vartis from the early days was to show that, no, no, the guys, that there can be a coexistence. Um, and yeah, and, and I've done an amazing job in kind of broadcasting that. And now with the advent of social media, um, it's easily accessible 
video, photos, you know, where it's evident what's happening. Um, people, this kind of new narrative is taking form of um, the power of safari as a, a tool to provide education, to provide well-being. It's not just a case of safari as a destination where you can go see animals. It's actually the power to make change in people's lives. That's really where, where the value is. Um, and they saw that from the I early days. Really. To the dark sky. So there are so few places on earth where we can see the Milky Way, where we can see the stars mm -hmm. as we used to in the dark sky. So I liken it that there are some very few special spots where we can actually go back and awaken that ancestral memory to awaken that uh, ancient relationship that we once all enjoyed, as you mentioned. But go ahead. Yeah. And I, I mean, the, just on the, the scars, actually, I'm ashamed to say I didn't put in a, a photo of the stars, but maybe I can find one quickly and, and, and stick it in there. That'd be great. We have ama amazing uh, astro viewing here. And, you know, part of the experience, especially in winter when the skies are clear for about five months in a row, wow. every evening when we're out on drive, because we'll generally go out in the afternoon, stop for a little drink and stretch the legs as the sun sets, and then... Uh, on the drive home, we'll stop, switch off the vehicle and turn off all the lights and just, you know, look at the amazing panorama above us. And it's, it's an emotional experience. And it also speaks to the, 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 the kind of reconnection with that primeval side of you. And we've, we have people just burst into tears spontaneously when they see the Southern stars for the first time. It's, it's pretty special. Yeah, yeah and we're lucky that there's very little light pollution in the area. So, yeah, we, we, we really want to that. understand our early ancestors. We need to see those skies just as much as we need to see that wildlife. We need yeah. to experience what they experienced mm. to get them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, very much so. I just included this map quickly for those who haven't been to Londolosi, just to kind of show where we are in the greater scheme of things. This is Africa on the left here. Um, all these green areas are uh, established conservation areas. I think the mandate across most of Africa is to have, try and have a minimum 10% of your landmass under conservation. Um, so in Africa, you can't actually see it. It doesn't look like we're doing too well, but there is a lot more land under conservation here. I think they're only showing the national parks, but they're huge tracts of land that under private ownership um, that, are, that are conserved. And it, 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 we are up, upwards of 10%, although it doesn't look like there's a lot of green on this map. Um, but we at Londolosi are right up in the northeast corner here in this little circle. So if you jump over to this map, we're on the corner of South Africa, Zimbabwe, and Mozambique, part of the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park. It's the largest transfrontier park of its kind in the world. It's a couple of, it's about six million acres, and it incorporates reserves from South Africa, uh, Zimbabwe, Mozambique. Most of the international boundary fence has been taken down to allow for free roaming um. movement of wildlife. Yeah, it's very special. And the intention is to incorporate these other two national parks in Mozambique into one massive area and just have this contiguous wildlife centric um, wilderness area with an elephant potentially able to go from the southern parts of the Kruger National Park right up into the northern parts of, of the Zimbabwe section if he so wanted to. And you'd take a couple of months and he'd lumber up there. Um, but you won't encounter any fences here. We are down in the southwest in the Sabi Sands, this is a zoomed in version of where we are. So this is the Sabi Sand Reserve, contiguous with the Kruger National Park out to the right. And Londolosi is, is right in the heart of the reserve. Um, but again, there are no fences. All these lines you see, these little dotted lines, these are just um, reserve boundaries where for different landowners. So we own this land, our neighbors own the others, and, and we stay on our patch, they stay on theirs. But it's all open. The wildlife can come and go. I was saying we get leopards wandering in from the Kruger Park out here, lions coming from the Kruger, and we see free movement. We don't manage the wildlife population at all. It's all self-regulated. Um, so you can see, yeah, things like this. This is a, a big male who established himself. He's on a mission. He came in another reserve. Yeah. Are there any questions so far, guys? Sorry, I know I'm sort of rattling through a few slides here, but if anyone wants, has anything to ask? Or... I'll open it up to questions in a bit. Do you want to continue? Okay, cool. Yeah, we'll, we'll press on. I mean, just I'm just wanting to highlight some of the viewing that we have. And this is just an, just an example of... Uh, how the leopards are habituated to the vehicles. This, it's, we're not quite as close here as the photo would suggest. This is a long lens and it compresses the image. So it looks like the, the vehicle's right on top of them. In fact, they're about 20 meters away from the leopard. This is our, our dominant male at the moment um, around the camps. But you couldn't have this if you didn't have the early trackers putting in the work, finding the leopards, bringing in the vehicles to sit with them for hours at a time, sometimes just patiently over days, weeks, months, 
to get the leopards relaxed to, to the vehicles. And the same with elephants. We're looking at a history in which there's been no hunting for generations. And the animals in whatever shape or form have stopped seeing people as a threat. I mean, there's some areas in Africa where hunting still takes place and an elephant like this would be running a mile if it even got wind of a vehicle coming. But here it's, you know, they, they go about their daily lives and essentially ignore us. Obviously an elephant is a big and potentially dangerous animal, so you, you have to judge their mood, but you can get these views and, and uh, showcase the wonders of Africa to, um, to guests from all over the world. Now, we were talking about tracking earlier, Lauren, I know you asked me about what you need to, um, to follow an animal and, and look for signs. And this is just a photo taken of a couple of the ranges uh, during lockdown. This is last year when we, the only guy, there were only a few of us on site and it was essentially just a small media team, the guys who had experience with cameras and photography and training. And we were here trying to broadcast what was happening on the reserve to, uh, to, the, to the world. Um, but we aren't the experienced trackers. So <laughs> these two, actually, this is Kevin and, and Pete. These are the guys who are in that silhouette shot on top of that rocky outcrop just now. Um, and then this is James, our head ranger. Um, and we were, we had to find our own animals because it was just us here. It was only sort of four or five of us. Um, there were no trackers on site. Most of the reserve had gone home because we didn't have any guests. And it was a wonderful, although frustrating, appreciation of the skill level of the trackers. This indigenous art form that these guys have honed over years and generations. Because every now and again, if it was a sandy road like this, we'd be able to find lions, leopard, whatever we might have been looking for. I mean, this morning, for instance, we were tracking a big pride of lions. And thankfully for us, they were on this road and they walked about two and a half kilometers straight down it without deviating. So we were able to find them quite, quite quickly. Um, but we realized how out of our depth we were. And it's these guys, it's, this is Andrea and Susant, and they're one of our best ranger tracker teams. Um, in fact, and Andrea used to be a tracker and then he moved on to become a guide because he, he loves the, the human interaction side of things, but he's still one of our best trackers. Um, and Susant, who, who's one of his good friends and they work together very closely. Um, and Andrea, in fact, he came through the tracker academy. Both of these men are, are products graduates of the Tracker Academy that I mentioned earlier. So they didn't grow up learning the, um, the skill sets from their, their fathers like many did before them. They went to this academy that taught them these skills. And they are these ph phenomenal guys who somehow had it inherent in them to be able to track animals. And Andrea, in fact, is so good. He's gone to, treat, to teach tracking in South America. He's gone to educate um, local guys in Brazil, how to track jaguars so that they can habituate them like the leopards that we see here. And the project that he helped establish has been so successful that whereas 20 years ago, they were seeing one jaguar every two months when it would come in and kill a cow on the local ranch. Now they're enjoying daily sightings like we do at Londolozi of the leopards. And it's because of efforts, the efforts of Andrea and another guy called Richard who he went with, who's also a tracker at Rondolozzi. I mean, they were teaching, they were exporting this indigenous knowledge to South America. And now it's being used over there to kind of uh, uh, form the same model of ecotourism that, that we employ here. What's the tool and, in his hand, if you go back, what was the tool that he held? Um, the uh, on the right, yeah. Okay, so Andrea's just got a rifle. That's just standard practice when we're going out with guests um, for just for safety. It's a, it's a bit, uh, regulation. Um, this is just a tracking stick that a lot of the guys carry. It's, the local name is a shigia, and it's like a little club. And it's essentially just it's a tool used for, it's kind of the illusion of safety because you're not going to be able to do much against an elephant with that. But... <laughs> It's very handy as a little marker. Whenever you see Sasantia, what he's doing is he's probably underlining a track. So whenever you're walking, you're following the line of tracks down the road. Every track you see or every second track you see, depending on how clear they are, you'll underline them. So that if you then lose the tracks and there's nothing further, you can go back to where you know you saw the last one because it's underlined. And from there, you can then determine, okay, has the animal turned? Has it deviated? And you could work it out a little bit better. But also maybe he was like casting a shadow if it helped him see it better or pushing a leaf away or something. Oh, that can happen. Yeah. Often if there's, if you actually with track, you generally don't want to sh your shadow over it. It flattens the image and 
um, you can't see it as well. What you want, ideally, tracking is best done in late afternoon or early morning when the sun is at an angle that it casts a shadow in the track. The little ridges that are formed by the indentation of the footprint Marvin. mean that there's this little delineation and contrast that enables you to see it a lot better. When the light's directly above midday or on a cloudy day, it can, it can become very hard to see the track. So uh, yeah, he's probably actually trying to keep his shadow away from it. I was going to say that the habituation of a population of the predators to human presence helps me understand how our early ancestors could have coexisted happily with them. Um, and, and we have this idea, oh my, lions, tigers, and bears, oh my. Um, but I think that you're describing a way to coexist um, with the larger predators. I just keep wondering how our ancestors handled it. But I think there's just ways and means and a language between them, you know their patterns you know, oh. to you and the environment. So it's helping me understand that. I just want to say. Yeah, and I think it's a, it's a again going back to your story about how um, the the perceived danger level of the city for someone who comes from the bush and vice versa. I mean, I've spoken to a lot of people who live in both environments, and I know that. Most of the, the guys I know who are rangers or, or guides who've lived in the bush for years would happily walk from the top of Kruger Park to the bottom, unarmed, sleeping under the stars every night. And that's 300 kilometers because they know that in the greater context of the reserve and the wildlife behavior, how animals react to people, it's fairly safe. Because you can, you, if you understand how they fit into the environments, you can make predictions as to what they'll do when they'll do it, why they'll do it, and you can adjust your behavior and your route accordingly, and you're probably going to be pretty safe because it's, it's understanding that you know the behavior. That. You know exactly. You know, you know the rules that govern everything. Exactly. But then when you go to the city, it's unpredictable. Like I'd much rather take, take a month on my own in, in the Kruger Park than one night in a dangerous, in a, in a, I don't know, a, a dodgy area in Johannesburg. Um, the, the bush, there's, a, there's an understanding and a kind of the natural laws that govern things rather than, than human laws, which tend to be a little bit more open to interpretation. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah. Yeah. And just, I want to just touch on these guys briefly. I mean, we we're talking about tracking and how it was the early, the early trackers who really started everything. And these are two, two gentlemen who were part of the first, the core of the first tracking team. This is Phineas Mflongo on the left and Kimbian Amnisi on the right. And these are two of the first guys who would regularly go out and track leopards in the world. I mean, this is essentially what they were paid to do on a daily basis. They'd go out and they'd track the mother leopard, that original female. Um, and, and we, where we are now with Andrea and uh, Sasant there, and what we do and what the viewing we're able to enjoy as a result of these early trackers, excuse me, we're essentially standing on the shoulders of giants. And these guys put in the hours endless hours to find animals that were in no way relaxed to the presence of people on, on foot or on vehicles or otherwise. So they, it, was, it, was, it was a thankless task for them for many years. Um, but they're also an example of how they or the skills used to be passed on from father to son. So Phineas and Flongo is from a very strong tracking background. His two brothers, Elmon and Flongo, and Rhenius and Flongo are both very prominent in the history of Londolozi. Elmon and Flongo was John Varty's partner in those early movies I was telling you about, the early cinematography that they used to make, Silent Hunter, and um, that really put Londolozi on the map as the place to view leopards. And Phineas's youngest brother, Rhenius, he was the co-founder of Tracker Academy, which Andrea and Sassant are products of. And, and Rhenius is still one of the most renowned trackers in Africa. And he has tracked mountain lions in Patagonia. He's tracked bears in California. He's gone to Brazil to track jaguars. Um, I think he's been to Australia recently to give talks on tracking. And, and it's so cool and thrilling to know that this indigenous skill that was around for so many years and now is being lost, but that this wonderful man is doing so much to maintain and uphold it's being recognized as invaluable all over the world now. And, and Renius is, I mean, he's one of the most well-traveled trackers ever because of the countries he's visited to just impart his knowledge and, and his experience. Um, and it was him and, and other guys like him that, that paved the way for, 
where London Losey is today. And, 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 and we... Diane Fossey and Jane Goodall habituating the chimpanzee and the mountain gorillas just by showing up every day, being patient and letting them yeah. know. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's just, it's patience. It's hours, it's time in the field. And, you know, there's, we try and, and educate everyone who visits London Losey um, about how we got to where we are now. Because we, we're very fortunate to have this incredible history. I mean, I think we were the second photographic safari lodge in South Africa. Um, and we've got these archives. We've got the history of the pioneers coming in with ox wagons and then in the 70s, the lodge started and then the, the habituating the leopards. And um, yeah, we, we, yeah, we, we, we tell stories all the time about how it started. And we are, we're very fortunate to be where we are and have that legacy that we try and pass on to, to future guides, future trackers, any future employees. Um, and I know, Laura, just I, I put this photo in because you were talking about, I know you asked me in an email about special relationships with particular animals and kind of connections. And I know that there's, it's not a two-way thing. If you ever have a connection with an animal out here, you might see a lion that you've followed for years and, and understand its behavior. But I'm fairly certain the lion isn't going to recognize us or the leopard isn't going to recognize us. We're just another person in a vehicle ignoring it um, or being ignored by it. Um, but I, I included this female because I had, I think the closest I've come to being killed in the wild was her. So I, I always had a special affection for her, as, as contradictory as that sounds. She did um, the task. She, yeah. yeah, so we, I, I got a little bit too close unknowingly to her cubs, her newborn cubs. So once we found this, this is now three newborn leopard cubs, blind, they haven't opened their eyes yet. And quite by chance, we found them. We knew that she'd given birth and we drove to a rocky outcrop, which is an extensive series of boulders that would form perfect den site for leopards. And there were multiple places where these cubs could be. We drove up and we parked and we were looking up on the, on the rocks to see if we could see her. And quite by chance, one of the rangers who was with us just looked down into this little hole that was very close to the car. I said, oh my word, there they are. And we saw these little cubs just hiding there. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this is a once in a lifetime sighting. You, I'll probably never see anything like this again. To see newborn cubs that are, they don't, don't even know they're leopards. They look gray because their spots are so close together. They're probably two, three days old at this point. Totally vulnerable, totally defenseless. And the mother wasn't there. So as part of our policy, we don't want to be this noisy thing driving around that might impact them. They might get freaked out. I mean, we don't know what their senses even like at this stage. But we left pretty quickly and then just left them to it. And then a couple of years later, um, this litter grew up and moved on. And then this female... Again, we found her pregnant and we found her tracks heading towards the same boulder cluster where those little cubs had been kept. And I was with a tracker called Mike and he, was, he stayed with the tracks we'd been following for about 20 minutes and we were getting close to these boulders and, and Mike said, listen, we, so this, sorry, just to journey back, the last time we'd seen this female, she'd been heavily pregnant and that had been a month before. So we presumed the cubs had given birth, had, had been birthed and she was now heading to the same area we knew she had denned in before. So we had a fair amount of certainty that there were gonna be little cubs there, but knowing leopards and leopard behavior and how defensive and aggressive they are, if you approach them with the little cubs, we were very cautious and Mike said, look, I'm gonna stick in the riverbed to see if the tracks continue. You go back to the vehicle, fetch the guest and, and drive up and meet me near the boulders. So I drove around, Mike stayed in the river and he, he said, look, tracks go up to the rocks and then they come down again and they continue in the riverbed. And there's a little water hole where her tracks all over the place. And he said to me, listen, I think, I think the cubs are here in these rocks, but she's, she's spending time here because there's so many tracks by this little water hole. She's obviously coming down to drink and then going back. And now I, I knew where this little cave was because I'd seen it before and I knew, okay, she's been there before. That's a good place to look. And now when we'd seen these cups, this is now, this was in 2013, when we'd seen them, because we just quickly looked down, took a photo, it was summer, it was overgrown, we didn't get an idea of the extent of this hole, how big this cave was. And when I'd seen it here and even looked at the photos, I thought, okay, it's just a little gap in the rocks where she birthed cubs and then, Stab you know, stash them, exactly. And generally when a leopard's denning, one of the signs you look for is flattened grass just outside the entrance because that's where the mother will lie down 
she'll call the cubs out she'll nurse them and then she gives a little noise and they scamper back into the into the into the den so i looked very carefully for the signs of flattened grass any evidence that said this is where she was keeping them and i didn't see anything like that so i presumed okay obviously in this extensive boulder field she's chosen somewhere else and so i said to the guests who were sitting in the vehicle i said look i'm just going to get out and i'm going to go join mike down in the riverbed and together we'll see if we can find the den and we'd scanned the boulders very carefully there was no sign of the female so we presumed okay she's obviously come to the den nursed the cubs and then moved on again probably to go hunting and i thought okay well while i'm going to join mike i'm quite curious to see what the inside of this little den looked like that she'd used before now i'd said that the first time we'd seen this we'd had a quick look in and there were just these little cubs what i didn't know because it was so overgrown at that time is there's actually almost like a little a cave system that goes in that extends into the den that we hadn't been able to appreciate the first time and unbeknownst to me she was in there with these newborn cubs that she'd given birth to probably a day or two before so i leaned down and i checked carefully i mean i know it sounds like a stupid thing to do and it was a stupid thing to do when i think back to it but i leaned down looking looking couldn't see anything and i thought okay let me just look into the cave just to see what it's like you know because there was a den a couple of years ago these home. things are interesting yeah and she was in there with these cubs that she'd just given birth to and i leaned down and i put my hand on a rock that was just outside the entrance and I, as i bent over just this leopard erupted out of the ground out of this cave i mean this the teeth were bared and the snarl and she was just slashing her claws and i mean i had a rifle but there's no i i'm not going to shoot her and there's no you realize how futile it is to even carry one because it was so fast if she'd wanted to slash me open i was tickets i mean half a second and she's just coming up with teeth bared it's i'll never forget that face of probably i mean a meter from mine as she just came out of nowhere and luckily because i sort of squealed and stumbled over backwards and rolled on my back and did sort of a triple flick flick to try and get some distance Hasty, she yeah. i think it also got a fright and she just went roaring off in the opposite direction straight past the car and i think the guests got a huge fright cuz uh because she was making a huge noise and took her, she they must have thought she was coming straight for them but luckily she she bypassed the vehicle and disappeared into the bushes <laughs> um so okay. very sheepishly and they saw the whole thing so very sheepishly i was sort of shakily made my way back to the land rover and oh, uh doesn't it climbed aboard yeah and had a and had a um i think i had a stiff whiskey for breakfast that day to kind of calm the <laughs> bed <laughs> it was not that you can develop a personal relationship i mean we can with them but they're not bonding with us well we we heard, we saw the octopus teacher and he felt that that octopus did have a personal relationship with him that is a beautiful movie to see right. my octopus right. teacher but yeah. what, what i was trying to get at was i felt that in the moments interaction with the lion that charged me albeit with bars between us that i was imprinted that there was a moments relationship with him that i will carry with me for the rest of his life not him but that there was some transfer of of i don't know something um and mm. and it was incredibly special and it was done in admiration um from my end um yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely you know, that there's, I, I, that there's a mystical transfer almost you could say because it impacts us so deeply mm. i would say that it wakes yeah. in us so deep and so primal and so buried in our dna that's I, I, yeah i agree and i i like to think that there was something similar here but i i've always kind of tried to keep myself back from going down that road because i know the temptation is to go it would be for me to go too far and say oh no we we recognize each other There's but I, you have I know I, standards to keep yeah, <laughs> but go ahead yeah exactly I, I, and it's also that i feel that i can't speak for her that's 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 for her you know and i i like to think that there is this that there was this recognition sham she actually she died a couple of years later she was she was attacked by lions and then we never saw her again um and but that and i think i remember feeling her loss quite 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 sadly because you know you you try not to get too attached to wild animals and you know that there's a there's a life cycle and the life span and the time will end um but i remember with her because she was quite she was one of our more enigmatic efforts, uh, leopards we didn't see her that often her territory is in a very difficult area to track her down she spends a lot of time in the sand river where you can't access with a vehicle 
So sightings would be very infrequent. But I know whenever she was found, I'd specifically make a point of going to see her because of exactly what you say. I, I, I like to think that there was something mutual, uh, but, but I, I, I don't feel like I can speak for her, so I can't actually say it definitively. I, I'm, I can't say that that lion had from his end. No, I'm just saying from my end. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, for sure. And, I, and yeah, and I, I always felt like, so selfishly, I always thought of her as my leopard after that incident. When I mean, it's a little bit stupid because she could have killed me. But uh, I like. I think part of the fact that she didn't added to that Just connection, stick. if you want to call it. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I felt a, a lot of gratitude. Put it that way. <laughs> right. And you can't blame an animal for being uh, who they are and doing what they are designed to do. I oh, completely. No, no, I mean, that was totally my fault. I was an idiot. And I learned, and I've never done that again. So, uh, so yeah, but it's yeah. So, sorry, so you had another question? Oh no, no. Who's and we're going to take questions here in a little bit. So sure. Do we yeah, have? Sorry, yeah. So yeah, and no, I'm just sort of going on a couple of more um, sure. scary incidents and encounters. I mean, this is a thankfully oh, no, we don't no. see we don't see many snakes out here. Well, there are a few out here, but they're generally quite shy. Um, but I, I had a this was a very close encounter with a mamba. This is Africa's deadliest snake. And um, I happened to be on foot with quite a long lens. I think we were just doing some filming of general game and there was a bit of a noise off to the side and we heard some birds alarming and turned to look what it is. And, and the birds, they alarm very loudly at snakes and they recognize species of snakes and at mumbas, which eat birds, they make a lot of, uh, kick up a lot of fuss. And I just happened to turn with the camera, luckily I had it at hand and at eye level about two meters away was this this mamba staring at us out of this fallen log and we disturbed it. And this is almost scarier than a leopard or a lion at close range because these things can move fast and they're unpredictable. And yeah, snakes are, uh, I get, they give me the heebie-jeebies. I mean, like I said, thankfully we don't see many of them. They're generally more afraid of us. But this close encounter was one that I, I was pretty rattled by because, you know, walking a meter or two either way and it could be, could be life or death. We were just pretty lucky that I think the snake heard us coming, stuck its head up. We were able to spot it in time and, and didn't continue to, towards where it was. We changed direction very quickly. But, um, you know, in terms of close encounters, that's, that's one. Um, and then, and yeah, this photo, this is sort of talking more about associations or, or connections with animals or being, um, yeah, what's the word? Um, yeah, getting getting attached. This lioness is the last one out of her pride. So her mother died, her aunt died, her siblings got killed, just whittled away over the years by other lions, buffalo, whatever it might be, all natural causes. And she's the last one of her pride. And it's a pride that's been viewed at Londolozi for over 20 years. And she gave birth to three little cubs all by herself without a pride to help her um, in March two years ago. So yeah, two years ago this month. Um, sadly, two of them were killed by a leopard. Um, she had left them to go hunting and they were uh, stashed in a little den and uh, two were killed and she managed to get back in time to save one. And she is still raising this single cub, which is now two years old, it's her daughter. And when, and so in this situation, almost certainly the, that young lioness is going to stay with her mother, assuming she survives, because she's just about at an age where she's safe from other lions, um, male lions in particular, because males will want to mate with her mother and they'll try to kill her while she still depends in order to bring the mother back into estrus. Um, but if her mother can just keep her out of harm's way for another six months, I think she's golden. And then as a unit of two, then they can become a pride again and, and start to sort of reestablish themselves. But you're just talking about special, call them characters in, in the animal world that we see here. She, this lioness is one, sorry, I know she's out of focus, um, but this kind of summarizes this photo. It kind of represents the, the absolute dependence of these little cubs on her. They look at her, they're just looking at her with sort of awestruck admiration because she's literally the thing that stands between life and death for them. And she's still got one of these little lionesses that she's raising and is now two years old. And hopefully they, they you know, become the, the future of their pride. And, and talking about getting attached attach to them, this is her last year, um, just after a savage encounter with a rival pride. Because she's all by herself, remember? 
and she was caught. I don't know what the situation was here, but how she got to where she was. The pride was actually a little bit of out of their territory. Um, and they attacked her, six big lionesses, and they cornered her up against the riverbank. This is a steep drop just below her of about three meters. Um, so it was safer for her to get her back up against the wall or up against the drop, as it were, and they can't come at her except from the front where she can defend herself. Um, and we found her, we heard the roaring and the fighting, we found her badly injured. Sorry, she wasn't badly injured, she was superficially injured, but she looked badly injured. Um, interestingly enough, the male, the males, there were two males here, they were essentially defending her. They were kind of getting between the rival lionesses and her. This male, he's, what he's doing, it's called the Fleming Grimace, and it's a test of pheromones from the lioness's urine. And it's just an instinctive thing for him to tell if she's an estrus or not. Um, and this male essentially stood between her and what might have been a, a very sticky end, although we don't know what would have happened ultimately because uh, these lionesses are actually related to her. They're second cousins. I think they shared grandparents. Um, and they're part of the lineage of those four males that we saw earlier. So there's there are all these relationships going on. And we don't actually know if these lionesses, the big lionesses, would have followed through and killed her, whether they recognized that they are related to her because they haven't re ever encountered her. She had left the pride by the time they came along and you know, there's a whole history, but they've never really encountered each other in a social way. They've always been separate entities. Um, but I don't know, maybe there's some kind of uh, genetic recognition in her smell that would have stopped them following through. But you know, when you go from this to, then she's down to one cub. I think it's this little cub was the one that survived. And now, this is now last year where that cub is now a year old and still heavily dependent on her. Um, you can't help but get emotionally involved because you want, you know, you're rooting for the underdog and, and hopefully she makes it. And thankfully, they, they both made it fine. We, were, we didn't see them for about two weeks after this. So we didn't know if she'd succumbed to her injuries or if the cub had been killed, but then we found them and, and, and all's, all's well that ends well so far, thankfully. Wow. So, yeah, just show you wow. can get attached very quickly. Yeah. Oh my. Mm. And then, yeah, Laurie, you asked about this one. This is a. a oh, I like it. <laughs> yeah, I know you commented on this this photo. This is um, a young male leopard. In fact, if we're linking here, so the young female that was standing up on the running board of the Land Rover, looking at her reflection. Yes. This is her son. He's, he, she's his mother. So she was a cub in that photo. She grew up, she had a litter of cubs, and this is the young male from her first litter. Successfully raised to independence, and now he's an independent male, and he's moved off, and he's doing his own thing. Um, and this photo was from, I think this is from January, actually, this is from this year. And this is now what leopards do when they have been seen, and the alarm's been given, and other creatures are shouting at the leopard, because everything here is wary of leopards because they'll eat big antelope, they'll eat small antelope, they'll eat little birds, they'll eat anything. Yes. So invariably, if a creature sees them, it'll sound the alarm. And when they get seen and the alarm is being given, they stick their tail up over their heads like this. And it is That's just like a white. Birds up and the other just say, okay, you've seen me, quiet down. Exactly. It's like, well, you got me guys. Sorry, I'll leave. <laughs> you know, when, they're, when they're stalking, that white, yeah. That white tail tip is very visible, very visible. There's a high level of contrast between the black and the white. So when they're stalking, that tail goes flat down and they hide it almost on the ground. But the moment the alarm gets given and they realize, okay, I've been seen. Because sometimes animals will alarm because they think they see something and the leopard will just stay down. And if the alarming is discontinued, then the leopard will realize, okay, I've got away with it. And I can carry on stalking. But if the alarming carries on, the leopard realizes it's been seen and, and the, the, the tail goes up and yeah. yeah i mean sometimes it's just obvious this this leopard wasn't even trying to stalk this was in a drought about two years ago uh, sorry four years ago 2016 and you can see how sparse and how sparsely covered the area is i mean this air where this leopard is walking now uh it looks like this but back then there was no we hadn't had rains for about two years and mm -hmm. it was very difficult for leopards to hunt Prey because there was no cover. They're heavily dependent on cover, the element of camouflage, being able to sneak up on things. Um, and you can see this impala standing very erect, ears towards the leopard, focused in and sounding the alarm. So the leopard just, just went on its way. And here, yeah, same thing. I mean, impala, leopard, no chance to hunt, and invariably the leopard just moves on. And impala and, and antelope, they tend to be very aware of 
and a predator's body language. So if a leopard's just walking around down the road, not trying to hide, the impala will alarm at it, but it won't be as loudly or as intensely as if the leopard is slinking down in, in um, office, uh, exactly in specific hunting mode. Then they realize, hey, that's a threat. Same with lions, same with any predator. If it's just walking, they'll sound the alarm, but not quite as loudly. If it's hunting, they can recognize that body language behavior and then they up the volume and, oh. and everything realizes. You're reading. Yeah. I found it interesting. I was just reading how not only do the, the uh, fauna alarm, um, but also the flora can alarm. And that um, somebody was saying, you know, the smell of new cut grass, that's actually yeah. specific uh, biochemical that, that a grass would release into the air when it is being cut or chomped on. And it's a signal to the other outlying um, plants to say, hey, attack underway. Really? And, the, and the plants will actually take the sugars out of their leaves and put it down into their roots for conservation, thinking I'm going to lose some foliage here, so I might as well conserve. Oh. Or that there's pheromone exchange between trees about I'm getting eaten by the giraffe, so put more yep. tags in and make it more. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah, but it, it's, yeah a- it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. incredible. The, 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 the communication between plants. I mean, and, and you'll see we were talking about, I think when we were chatting on email, we were talking about how um, this kind of red red queen hypothesis, the arms race between predator and prey and between plants and herbivores. It's a similar thing. And, you know, like giraffes in response to that, they feed upwind so that the pheromones that the plants are releasing, they'll only go downwind. So only those plants will initiate the defense mechanism. But if they go upwind, those plants haven't yet had a chance to detect that there's herbivory going on downwind and the giraffe can then still get a meal if they alter their, their direction of feeding so to speak so possible and, and yeah. it's an intellectual understanding it just knows that when i do this it's it's mm-hmm. um more available more about yeah yeah well, a couple of questions too yeah, as we come to an end and uh and yeah. uh, the, do you have more slides or are we how are we doing with slides oh there are a couple more i mean i was just going to show a couple of uh of you know yeah, getting right. stuck yeah, and you know some of the over if you don't mind if the audience doesn't mind but yeah, i do want to give people the opportunity to yeah absolutely i mean i just just a couple of shots of you know i know you're asking about the hazards of the job and getting stuck and this is yeah. part of our part of the fun of it you know this is me and, and the general uh, the operations manager will we were following some wild dogs last year and uh, got stuck in the sand river and then had to get a tractor to pull us out after a couple of hours and it's just it's all part of it it's all part of the fun it's part of the storytelling uh, the the immersion in the wilderness for people you know and and i remember when i first got stuck with guests and i was panicking thinking oh no i've ruined their safari they've come all the way from europe to enjoy this wildlife viewing experience and we were stuck and we were having to dig out I and mean, i was sending them to go get logs and it was an absolute disaster in my mind they were we got to camp right and we got back to camp and they said it was the best thing ever because they felt that they were just part of the whole experience and we weren't tracking anything, but to get off the car and feel a bit vulnerable. And we broke the cool box out and had gin and tonics. And yeah, and they loved it. So it was just, yeah, exactly. And it was just kind of, it, it, it re-emphasized how the experience is what counts. It doesn't matter what you're seeing, what, you know, if the animal's active, it doesn't, it, the, it's an experience. And it's not, it shouldn't be predefined by seeing an animal or getting a good photo. It's, it's just immersion in that environment through whatever shape or form. Yeah. Wow. So. Question, sorry, I know we're running out of time. So yeah, yeah so we'll, we'll, you close the slideshow when you're ready and then- um, Yes, uh, yeah, absolutely. So, so, let me, uh, Elizabeth, cool. Elizabeth said, uh, I was there oh. in, uh, in 2006 oh, wow. during the elephant breeding, Steve the elephant yeah. Gave the land a good rover. Oh, gave the land rover a good chase. The yeah. was amazing. The place was wonderful. Safari was a blessed event. So well, yeah. Elizabeth, come on then. Yeah, come and on then, and uh, I know James will want to hear oh, from you directly. And it also, uh, yeah. Yeah, Laurie, did you get your question answered? I think she had her hand up for a while. Um, looking down the list here, uh, lots of comments, not necessarily questions or ended, but I thought, uh, oh yeah, Laurie, go ahead. Mm. Hi, James. That was beautiful. Hi, I'm, I'm so in love. My heart is just wide open right now to witness these incredible, you know, species that live with us, right? And what are they teaching us? So what I found interesting is you showed that 
shot of the little one up on the Jeep, yeah. right, investigating. So you see, that's our nature to be curious. Hmm. When you shared your story, it was you being curious. It wasn't yeah. fake, in my no. view, because it shows our own behaviors as nature. Do you see what I'm saying? It Absolutely. was an impulse from a curious wonder place that we all go to, right? So I thought it was actually quite beautiful. And I didn't necessarily even think that she was gonna hurt you. It's like a mother, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? She's like, yeah. no, you don't do that. And that was That's, it. Yeah. So she, she's, she's the teacher here, right? You're the student, like all of us. Hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. And I think that a lot of the, so much of the value and the lessons that that people get from being in, in the wilderness is that they see themselves mirrored back at themselves. And you know, and it's not just this is the lesson. I think a lot of the time they're different lessons depending on how you're interpreting the situation, and that's very much based on the individual and what you do see in that mirror. So yeah, mm -hmm. spot on. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Oh my goodness, because you know you're inspiring me. I, I recognize today, this is what I've always wanted to do, is to go to Africa. Uh, you know, selling my house. Place. Magic place. And I, I want to go all the way down south, and then I want to go to Africa. And that, I took pictures, so I know what, now where I'm going to come. So hopefully I'm going to meet you one day. Because I forward to having you here. I wouldn't want to drive, though. I would want to walk that land. That's what inspired me. Like, it was, I was like, what would it feel like as a group of people walking that land, creating that imprint, just like you created the imprint with the vehicle? Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. Perfect sense. Right? Oh, we're here. We're waiting. Right? Because it, it also made me think, well, isn't that how we would have walked through that land? Ages ago. Yeah, you know, a thousand years ago, five thousand years ago, you would have walked together as a tribe, right? Put your toes in that sand. Yeah. yeah. Oh my goodness! Of course, put our toes in that sand. Absolutely. And, it does and oh, just one other thing, you know, there was something about the night sky. I love the night sky. Mm -hmm. And what I I just want to say to everybody is because I really want people to think about this. We all need to start turning off our lights. At it night. impacts the insect world, but it also impacts us because we can't see the night sky. Yes. Yeah. Right? This is who we are. Agreed. So let's start a campaign. Yeah. Turn off the lights. That's a great idea, Lori. Absolutely. Thank you. We live in a dark Thank you. Right? Thank you. I'm so inspired right now. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. So I'm gonna I'm gonna find you, James. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> My, my question about the elephants is when they are doing their subsonic um, vocalizations that, that travel miles, do you feel it sometimes go right through your body? Do you pick it oh, up? Th you do, there's this kind of, it's a funny one. And that's, you know, you, you can sense that something, there's change within the herd. And you think, oh, how you, you can kind of, nothing's really, there's no audible, nothing definitely audible, obviously, because it's beyond our hearing range, but there's this kind of, when their behavior changes as a result of their communication, it's not just a case of you watching them and going, okay, the behavior has changed. It's a case of you feeling something and seeing it's at the same time. And uh, again, it goes back to a kind of reflection. It's, you are in some way detecting what they are communicating, although we don't have the means to interpret it or, or um, you know, properly make use of it, you still, the vibrations are out there, um, very low frequency, and they are necessarily traveling into you. So it's a very, very subtle thing, but there is definitely a change in your mood, however subtle, based on the behavior, which is almost certainly as a result of of those infrasonic rumbles, even though you might not be, and most of the time aren't actually aware of it. It's only in retrospect you think, hang on, they did that. And I felt that was probably- recognized that they were using that frequency. She said she did feel it. That's okay. how they actually got on. Yeah. Maybe I imagine some people are more in tune with it than others. Um, yeah, I, I know for, for me, it's it's more, it's far more, it's very understated. If I, I kind of feel something, I'm not, I'm not aware of an actual, 
communication taking place at the time. It's not like I tune in or anything like that, but you're definitely aware of a shift in something. Yeah. Very subtle. Because we're getting into the top of the hour and Paul's about to close. Okay. And, uh, I'm saying no. There's a couple more questions. We need a few uh, more questions. <laughs> so uh, people, are ask, <laughs> people are asking what time of year is best to come. And oh, also yeah. the question was, you see, oh, this look, looks like it's a cooler climate than expected. Uh, what's the climate? Uh, if you were coming at this time of year, it's not a cooler climate than expected. It's pretty hot in the summer. Um, so very different times of year. Summer, which is sort of October through to February, um, quite hot, but amazing abundance of life. It's the rainy season, so every, all the little ones are being born. There's bird life, migration. The bush is lush and green. It's just around every corner is something new and spectacular, and the whole place is vibrant. It can be rainy. It can be very hot. So those are things to consider. In the winter, it's very cold at night. So first thing in the morning when you head on safari, it's a hat and gloves and jacket, and you've got your hot chocolate and it's chilly. Um, but, and some animals aren't even moving around. The lions are kind of snuggling up. And then as the morning warms up, then you start seeing activity. So into the day for a long period of time, it's comfortable. It's a late morning. Lions are hunting. Leopards are doing their thing. Um, the bush is dry. It's brown. But every day is cloudless. It's wonderful. Shorts and a T-shirt night there are no clouds the stars are spectacular that's my favorite time of the year is the winter which is your summer so it's june july out here um so it depends what you're after i'd say come twice and both times so. <laughs> get both ends of the of spectrum course, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. fantastic so well yeah. oh and then cam asked a question have drones and the newer technologies helped with the science of larger cat behavior um, not so much cat behavior, we, uh, you know, because we have used them a little bit. We, we tend to limit their use um, in our part of the world. We've had an amazing opportunity over the last year to use them more than we normally would because they're quite heavily restricted because of air traffic. There are a number of uh, airstrips in the reserve where small planes are flying in, dropping off guests. So there's heavily, heavy regulations regarding drone use. But because of lockdown, where there were no planes flying in, we can now start using them a little bit to document behavior and more for just media purposes. But it did give us a bit more insight into a couple of things. Wild dogs, for instance, um, which is a, kind of the wolf of Africa. Not a lot of people know about them um, outside, of, outside of African conservation circles. They, we were able to watch their hunting behavior from the air. And it's incredible. I mean, we've gone back and kind of analyzed footage and seen how they operate as a pack. And, Historically, they were always thought of as just locking on as a team to one antelope and all just running it down in relays. And what we worked out from watching multiple hunts by the drone is that, in actual fact, they are just scattering into a herd. Every one of them just picks a target and just runs. And in, it's all haphazard, but the odds of one in 10 of them, the odds are that one out of 10 will catch something, and then they all get to feed on that. So they're kind of touted as these amazingly successful carnivores. In actual fact, they're not. Individually, they're pretty useless. But because there are, number, there are a number of them, one of them is probably going to get lucky and, and catch an impala, and then they can all feed. And, and it was amazing for us to get this insight from the air of, like, oh, this is what they're doing. Because when you're on the ground, you can't see. They just disappear into the bush, and then they're gone. But we could actually follow what they're doing, how they're doing it. And, and yeah, it was very, very cool. So we don't get to use drones as much as we'd like. But when we do, we are able to sort of get a, a whole new perspective on things, which has certainly helped in some incidents, instances to understand behavior a little bit. Pandemic for gathering up the, the drone footage. That yeah, way. yeah, we, we made proper use of it. I yeah. noticed clips of it in, the, in your blog. Um, and you've, inspired, you've inspired lots of uh, recommendations for books. People bored. Varty wrote a book called Cathedral of the Wild. Cathedral of the Wild, yeah. It's supposed to be a great mm -hmm. book. Uh, Dory said it's a great TV series called The Bronx Zoo, where they're taking care of rare endangered animals and, and uh, see that's a remarkable behind the scenes story to watch. And then also uh, we have David Abrams wrote a book called Becoming Animal, a remarkable story of him kayaking in the Pacific Northwest with the orcas and walruses. Yeah, the, the whole wow. experience with the orcas is another whole chapter oh, yeah. and story that we should have yeah. at some point. We have a friend that would put a water microphone down right. and start playing and then feel that the orca were sounding back to him, yeah. that they were carrying on a duet. Yeah. So, and wow. People want to follow your blog. I don't. I didn't type it into the thing here. I can copy and paste it, I think, in a moment so people can see 
Oh, there it is, James. You did it. I, I just did. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. I did. So, I to see the remaining photographs. Do we have time for that? Just um, the remaining. Yeah, yeah. Some more photos to share, James. Just looking at some of the the things we get to see. This is now. We're talking about leopards. Oh, leopards moving dens. You know, a female will stash a cub for a couple of weeks and then move to to a new location. And, and this kind of sighting, this is kind of bucket list stuff for every ranger who works in the bush. You know, you hope to see a mother leopard or a mother lion moving a cub like this. And their first two months um, moving or walking following their mom is they're a little bit vulnerable. They've got tiny little feet and they can't keep up very well. Most of the time, she'll just save time by picking them up and, and carrying them. And, and this was, yeah, I mean, the first time I'd ever seen that from a leopard. And I think I'd been in the bush for five years at this point. Where is um, it? Made, yeah, yeah, I thought it was like they take the nape of the skin of the neck, but it looks like there are little heads in there. Yeah, it's, so it's, her head is just out on the other side. It's a kind of a funny angle. Um, it's Yeah, it is right at the ba base of the neck. And, and apparently there are muscles there that when they get triggered by the teeth going into the neck, it just it, makes the cub become limp. And it just relaxes, it gets carried, and, and it doesn't struggle, which means that um, it's not going to get injured in any way. So just uh, I know you had a question on, on your email about learning behavior versus innate. And I know that there is a, a high level of instinct that governs an animal's behavior, but a lot of it, their development, especially predators, um, is from play and from interactions with, with their mother. Um, focusing mainly on leopards, the, the father, male leopards don't have any role in raising the cubs. It's all the mother. Um, so the cubs will play with each other and then play with, play with the mother if there's only one cub. And this is the same female again. Sorry. So this is a different female. Yeah, right. um, but the one, this one is the uh the mother of the one that had its foot up on the car and in fact the, which one is it it's this cub no sorry it's this one this is that cub a few months later it was the photo of her with her, her feet up but this is the same litter um sadly her sibling this one he was a little male we don't know what happened to him he disappeared after four or five months so most likely a hyena or a lion got him and, and sadly that's the reality you know we it's a very very low survival rate for for cubs in the wild um, and what why would a leopard a lion go after a leopard cub so it, predators generally try and eliminate other predators just because it's competition you know there's oh. there's a far more there's a far greater limit on resources herbivores don't compete because there's grass everywhere leaves everywhere they don't have to worry about uh, finding food um, but when it comes to predators they realize that they are respectively dangerous animals and the impala that's very hard to catch if it's eaten by that other predator, then it means that I'm not going to get any food. And they invariably just instinctively try and eliminate that competition. Okay. Um, that, that's for hyenas and lions, for leopards. So male leopards will try to kill uh, cubs that aren't their own because they want to mate with a female, but she's not going to mate while she's raising cubs. So oh. by killing cubs, it brings her back into estrus after a couple of months, and then the male will get his chance to, to reproduce. And so, yeah, it's, it's pretty sad watching the, the kind of life cycle and, and how so few of them actually make it. I mean, just this female, for example, I think she's, she's birthed 20 cubs plus by now, and only two have survived to independence. Wow. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough life for predators, a very low survival rate, but that's about standard. Not many of them make it through, but luckily this one has, and she's had... Uh, cubs survive by now, and, and I was saying earlier really, she's had a, um, she's just given birth to a second litter. Um, that's just nature playing the numbers game. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's it. Yeah, it's just numbers. Um, yeah, that's that's the reality we're dealing with, and that's I mean that's one of the reasons we don't get attached, but but it's hard not to. Um, and this one, this is this is playing with fire on a grand scale. So, yeah, this is uh, it, learning is is uh, often done the hard way, and this little cub about. This, half a second after this photo got taken got an almighty swatch from its father and uh, in actual fact its father was one of the ones in the picture of four males with the funny hairstyle and um, he's that's one of those males lying there so yeah this <laughs> this little cub got a got quite a quite a nasty shock and uh, when you got a, an almighty swat um and then yeah look at this this variety you know, crocodiles hippos these are this is obviously from a drone as well so this is when the river's drying out and we can get these unique perspectives on, on wildlife and, and what they're doing and dwindling water resources. We can appreciate, okay, well, it's very shallow. So this is how they operate. Um, 
and you can see this croc very close to these hippos in the background. So they sh two dominant creatures of Africa's waterways. But interestingly enough, they don't compete at all. They're quite happy to coexist very close to each other because crocs eat fish and the occasional antelope and the hippos are grazers. They just eat grass. So they can live side by side quite happily and, and very rarely step on each other's toes. But if uh, a croc was to do something stupid and get in the way and maybe attack a hippo calf, which does happen from time to time, um, a hippo is quite capable of biting a, a croc in half. So, yeah, you got to tread where. No. Uh, sorry, Laura. I was going to say, they, aren't they considered the most dangerous animals to humans as well? They are. And it's mainly a result of competition for water resources. So in rural areas where guys are going fishing, women are going to gather water for cooking and cleaning, you know, in a very tribal environment, you get hippos leaving the water in the evening to come graze, which is when a lot of people are going to the water and they tend to use the same pathways. And then in the morning, the same thing, hippos are returning to the water and uh, people are also going down to, you know, to gather their water for the day and you get these conflicts. And you know, when a hippo is two and a half tons and it's coming at you at 40 kilometers an hour, you're probably going to come off second best. So yeah, they're best, best avoided when they're, uh, when they're in a bit of a mood. And then, awesome. yeah, elephants, yeah, just a couple of highlights. I mean, there we are. We've got a lot of them on the reserve, big, small. And when they're young, they're fairly useless. They don't have, they don't have full control of their trunks. They just sort of flail them around and, and um, yeah, they, they don't quite know how to, uh, how to control them properly. And so you just see the very, very floppy and they stumble, uh, stumbling around trying to walk. And yeah, they're, they're some of my favorites. I, I love spending time with the elephants because they're always active. The lions will sleep most of the day. But elephants are always moving, they're feeding, there's wonderful social elements. And they can give you a bit of a warning. This cow was not too happy with us, but their herd had been disturbed by a pack of wild dogs running through about five minutes before. So she was a bit on edge. And that's when you've got to read the behavior. Because if you don't know that this is a warning sign for, for you to keep your distance, you might go a little bit too close and then she's got calves to protect and then you get in trouble. But if you just realize that ears up or head up, ears out is a, is a sign saying stay away, then, um, then you should be good. This is an old bull. He's just come from a nice mud wallow. It's a hot day in summer and he's cooling down. They often splash themselves um, in mud or water just to, uh, just to keep cool. That's like a nice sunscreen and to um, protect them against biting insects. And then, um, yeah, and there, 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 there's a star for, for Laurie if she's still online. <laughs> It's not the most uh, the full up of uh, the Southern Skies star picture I could include, but uh, in fact, that's probably even Venus. Looking at it now, it's probably not even a star because it's still evening and, uh, and it's, it's in the Western horizon. So I think that might even be a planet. But um, I think that's about it for the pictures I have. Uh, oh, thank you. A bit, 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 bit of a taste of, of what we see out here and that can inspire people to come out to Africa, whether it's Londolosi or somewhere else. But um, here we go. I wore my hiking boots for this, and I feel like I have been on safari. This has just been <laughs> yeah, so true. enchanting yeah. and wonderful. It's life changing. It really is, Laura. If you ever get a chance to come out, I, I can't recommend it strongly enough. I mean, obviously, I'm biased, but it's a special experience. You're just to sum up, what would be your last words for us today? Hopefully, we will talk with you again, but today. Um, cheapers. I, no, it's just, it's been thrilling to kind of connect with a, a group of like-minded people and I, I like that the sort of the, the message of conservation and wilderness and connection with the wild and ultimately with ourselves through that is something that's it's gathering so much traction and it's it's really wonderful to to hear or to be involved in, in sort of discussions and, and groups like this where you're hearing those same voices are um, are singing the same song. It's fantastic. So it's it's really it's it's encouraging. It's inspiring. It's it's uh, yeah. It, it makes me pretty thrilled to be um, yeah. And and so appreciative of, of being able to do what I do. And that the fact that now the world is in a place where we can broadcast this message through social media, whatever it might be. And it's it's cool to realize that it's 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 out there and it's coming from all different parts of the world. So yeah, <laughs> the it's, it's web great. of life is a pretty cool place. Yeah. To I have to say. And you've so. kind of expanded my view. When you think about water rights, you think about human to human battles, but all of a sudden you're right. And he, water rights is, is going to be the, the full web spectrum. of nature, the whole full yeah. spectrum. Yeah. Oh, that's a whole nother talk that we can talk about the river <laughs> preservation that we've got going on here. Yeah, Paul, next time we can go into that in detail. 
<laughs> we get it next time. Yeah. Okay, I'm yeah. looking forward to that. And, and, and James, as a as a cultural anthropological organization, whose you know special interest is in the preservation and uh, the documentation of indigenous cultural cultural knowledge. Um, I really appreciated you sharing the story of the tracking, understanding that there's a school for tracking to, to pass forward that knowledge. And, and uh, but also, of course, more importantly, today's discussion was focused on the preservation just of nature itself and the wildlife sanctuary and having a place for life to continue. And I just have yeah. more inspiration from you today and more hope for the future of, as humanity battles its way to find out how we're going to how we're going to go forward and uh, with people like yourself out there doing good work uh, it's very inspiring and encouraging so we do thank you so much for your presentation today yeah and thank you both again for for having me it was a it was a real honor to be to be on board this evening yeah well this evening here you can see actually you can probably see the color in the windows change it was blue when we started now it's black it's night time now so <laughs> the hyenas are already calling outside <laughs> thank you for uh thank you for today and for your talk and your photographs and your work and your your stories and all that you and the whole team uh, at there and all the other uh, guides doing what you do, which is to bring some economic support to the community in which you live, but also to open up the access and the experience for the rest of us mm. and to do it also um, digitally um, yeah. as yeah. well, to make use of these airwaves that we have. Yeah, yeah, that's what they're there for. So no, it's an absolute pleasure.